To our inaugural research uh, symposium 2023, um, we are privileged uh, to have the acting VC and our line manager, DVC Research and Internalization, to do a word of welcome. Over to you, Prof. Colleague program director, colleagues, uh, I, I wonder why the light is shining on me. <laughs> it's not load shedding, right? <laughs> so, so thank you, thank you so much uh, for uh, the invitation to be here and to say a few words at this very important uh, symposium. Um, I believe it is a historic day. Li libraries do do make history as well in many many ways. Um, so, I, I want to really start off by congratulating the library for this fantastic initiative. Um, uh, it, the library, as we all know, is not just simply an archive of information and people who work in it, but it's actually a, a, a live and fresh and active uh, source of energy and, and knowledge. And so, really, our library, I have come to understand, is quite active in the domain of research. Uh, librarians are one of the most amazing people I've ever worked with, and I must say this, you know, somebody coming up, studying, working with people in libraries, you get a sense of how committed people are, um, as information specialists, really wanting to go out there and assist people. So I, I want to start off with that at a very personal level. But it's critically heartwarming to see to what an extent the library is actively involved in really speaking to the real vision of 130, vision 130, particularly in so far as the research domain is concerned, but also more importantly in terms of the support. Uh, goal one, as we all know, uh, some of us might have internalized it, is to improve our academic excellence, reputation, and impact. This particular building, and all the satellites associated with it plays a critical role in driving that vision, in supporting our scholars and many who are here today. We're also aware that this university is, has reached the 800 band in the Times Higher Education rankings. Of course, there's much debate about rankings and where universities fit into that. But I do think it is important. We are an aspirational university. We, we have big goals, big dreams, and the library is part of that. And I'm, and I know that even if we might be number nine in the, in the country, not the big five, as we all say, not animals now, it's the <laughs> universities. Um, we anticipate with the interventions made by our library, that, that we will, we will, we will improve significantly because of the contributions. It's obviously so evident to me in my three months at this university to see the wonderful work and cutting edge research that is taking place. There are fantastic niche areas across the university represented by all the faculties. Again, I use the occasion to say thank you to the library. Keep up the good work in supporting our academic staff in all that you can do. So this is to be applauded. And why do I say that? Because it's not just simply the researchers, but you are playing a critical role as, as a support department to help to visibilize the research. Not only the research, but also our researchers. And I think this is really, really excellent. I'm going to be chairing pretty soon a committee of all the journals that are housed at, at the university. And so I want to say also congratulations to the library for playing a critical role in hosting COFSI journals, but also hosting important databases. I found it so easy personally as I was finishing off something that I have to submit as a publication to navigate the platforms 
and find the database. This is a really wonderful supply of electronic database bases that we have, but also, very importantly, the books that we have. I'm also quite excited, as I learned from our librarian, the critical role that the library is playing in open access, and, of course, the research data, uh, data management policies. Colleagues, really congratulations. I know, as I've spoken to the librarian recently, that um, open access is in high demand. Why? Because it increases the visibility. It helps with the citation when, when all those publications are open. So very, very important that we can keep that up. And I will be supporting it. I know at the level of the executive, there's huge support. There's buy-in from faculties. But of course, we also know that resources are scarce. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, but we, we, we do whatever we can to assist here. I'm also aware of the critical role played by a library, and again I'm speaking to the research domain, particularly in terms of um, supporting our researchers in terms of their NRF ratings. And that season of NRF ratings will start pretty soon, in fact it's already started. I've requested colleagues who are planning ratings and those who are going for re-ratings to consider uh, the, uh, the processes that we, that we are putting in place. And really, that, that is going to be quite, 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 I'm also excited from the research domain, the role played by the library in the following areas. And that is supporting our scholars from the junior level, including those who are being groomed and nurtured for the professoriate especially the Emerging Scholar Accelerator Program, the Future Generation Professoriate Group, the NGAP colleagues. So really fantastic work that you're doing in that domain. I'm also very excited to hear of how the library is showcasing our researchers. You're not just simply providing information resources. I, I have had the opportunity to, to navigate and check out the wonderful work that you're doing in terms of the, uh, the YouTube channel, particularly, and I've heard some exciting things about that that can only but enable and assist us and our researchers in, in becoming known, not only within UFS, but also externally. And I think, please continue with that. This is excellent work. Um, I've been informed about, you know, the, 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 the methodology that you're using, you're interviewing people, you're profiling them, you're kind of providing real top-notch ideas on, on, on their work and its impact. So really, really excited about that, including also helping with uh, um, transformative agreements uh, in so far as the library services are concerned for research. So colleagues, I, I'm not here to give anything uh, um, major in terms of uh, uh, insights, but really to lend my support, to congratulate you. I think this is a fantastic initiative. I hear it is a historic day, mainly because it's an inaugural seminar focusing on research. I really want to say, please keep it up and make this an annual event um, and, and make it bigger. Mm -hmm. And in whatever ways we can, we support you uh, to showcase our researchers uh, it's, it's to be applauded. Um, Janet, congratulations to you and the leadership of the library, and especially the research component uh, division within the library. I can only but wish you all the very best for today, and I want to say very humbly, thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words. I am aware that this is being live streamed, yes. and 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 should I should be respectful to also greet the colleagues not only in the room but also wherever you are in the virtual space. So I hope you find this a productive day, um, an important day, and the start of even greater things. And again, thank you, and and well done. Um, thank you very much, Prof. And the UFS Library and Information Services is proud to present the cream of the crop our researchers who have dedicated an exciting moment for the university.
Thank you um, very much. Um, I would like to claim that maybe this is the first event that uh, Prof. Reddy has addressed. Um, so it was in his also in his inaugural address to the to the GovC nation. Colleagues, um, we we had initially would have loved to start with tea and coffee, whilst um, unfortunately due to the pressure from 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 the engagement that Prof has, we we then decided to start a little bit early. So what I would suggest is that we would break just for 15 minutes for colleagues to quickly grab a cup of tea and a muffin and then we then it's immediately, can you confirm time? It's 12 now. Yes, let's be back at exactly half past nine. But you can also grab the cup and, and come back into the room, that would still be fine. And in the process, uh, Hercules, um, uh, you can, um, I think your presentation is ready, so you'll be next on the, on the podium. Colleagues, the tea is served outside, so you can grab a cup of coffee and a muffin and then join us. Around around uh, their time around the, the, the program. Um, you you would know that as a library, um, we we serve as the face of the university. Um, anybody who comes to any university, even the switchboard, who are supposed to know who is where, when you call the university, when they know, when they don't know who can assist, they send them to the library because uh, they know that we know. Um, uh, librarians are working search engines, even if we've, uh, we've got no idea. So one of, one, of the, one of the important things that we're doing currently, especially within my unit, we are saving, we want to, in, because what we have found out is that prospective m and struggle to, to, to find out who is where and what is what. For instance, a, a much more typical example would be a situation where a student who's doing a research would, would, collect, uh, would collect data and only look for people who can assist him with, um, with the data they have collected. But by that time, the unit that can assist them would not want to assist because they want to assist you right from the beginning so that the, you can plan together how are you going to collect the data. So, so one of our responsibilities as the library is, is to make sure that uh, our prospective m ts know exactly what is available. So we, we, when we establish the Digital Scholarship Centre, which is going to present after this one, one of the main aim was to have this one-stop shop. So as you enter the university, you come to a DSC. They will be saying, for this, we can contact so and so. For this, we can contact so and so. One of the partners that we have, fortunately, we also re 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 report to the one line manager who has just uh, moved now. It's the, the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures, which is ICDF. Uh, here to present is it's one of the, they've got two directors. One of them is uh, Hercules, I, 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 all, all the time I have to make sure, you know, not to, uh, Hercules Combrink, and who's going to present on, for us on ICDF. Thank you very much, leadership. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> you know, a digital futures can't be a digital futures without that sound. <laughs> um, thank you very much, leadership. Thank you very much to the library colleagues and everyone here in Bloemfontein today, as well as everyone that is virtual, and also acknowledge our colleagues from Papua and the South Campus. I think it's very important that we realize and recognize the importance of, of this particular um, situation where we are in. And also, just an extension of what Professor Vassar already had mentioned, very important, 
and absolutely we need to support the role and the role players that are feeding into Vision 130 mm. on this particular part. That digital futures is coming along really fast. <laughs> Really trying to encapsulate one thing that we focus on within the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures is to think around those components. Interdisciplinarity, very important. You don't have to skip the slide. I don't know. You can go. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, it's about interdisciplinarity. And so what that means. It's traditionally very difficult to conduct interdisciplinary research within an academic institution because entities don't always speak to one another. And then the question comes in, to what extent do support services, academic support services, and academics work together with a common goal? So that, that's something that's very difficult. Um, center is a very difficult concept as well because the center often implies not that it is a platform, but that it is some isolated island in, in its own right, which is not the case, given the first word. Digital, so it has to do with the things that have become ubiquitous to our lives, so things that are throughout all of our life. And if, if you think that human beings are human and we are not cyborgs, then you are wrong, because imagine a world without a cell phone. None of us can. You, we, are, we can't even do our work without a cell phone. You need authentication, etc. So. So we have already augmented technology into our daily life for a long time. This isn't new, and, and, and neither is it future music. Future music is to what extent will we be human, machine, and, and to what extent would we need to work with machines. And then the final part is this idea of future, this idea of future knowledge. And what does future knowledge production in this particular sense mean for us within the institution and within the work that we do? And so... If there's anything that you remember and keep in mind from today and from what I'm about to, to share and tell you, it is that you need to understand how important it is with all of the work that everyone is doing to try and build the future of knowledge in this space. Academics, support staff and academic support need to co-create and collaborate with industry, within the institution in and of itself, and from my perspective, the library, as well as places like the Digital Scholarship Center, all form part of this incredibly important compound. And there are other services on the, in the university space, like the Center for Graduate Support, that also plays a pivotal part in ensuring that our students, staff, and our academic researchers, externally and internally, collaborate and work together in this space. And, I, and if there's anything that you can remember from today's talk, it's these very basic three things that I often find interesting and fascinating about what makes a library a research hub. And I would like to maybe throw that seed in there. A library consists out of three components, really. The one is the infrastructure in and of itself. This building is very old, although very beautiful and new on the inside. The, the, the backbone of this building is a lot older than any of us. And, and that infrastructure will remain for a very long period of time. From that perspective, I see a library, and this might be a little bit of a different way of looking at it, but exactly as our leadership said, it's a one-stop shop. So in my mind, it's a wonderful laboratory for future knowledge. It's a way in which we can see the infrastructure of this building to see how people interact with information, how people use information, how people take data and translate that to information. And given the infrastructure that's here, a library poses a very unique opportunity for us to really look inwards into the students, how they use the space, and try and understand from a research perspective what makes the future of knowledge from a first year to a PhD student and, and what enables that within this space. So that's the one thing that makes a library in terms of future knowledge that, that excites me a lot. The second thing about a library that people often don't, don't mention, yes, there are books, and yes, there are electronic resources, but all of that is big data. It's monolith data that librarians have been incredibly good at not only organizing and categorizing, but also finding. Exactly as our leadership said, every librarian is, is almost a Google in their own right. They know everything about the spaces and the work that they work on. And then the last part, 
is the librarians themselves. A library, the infrastructure, the books, the electronic resources would be nothing if it's not for the people that manage this information. And so from the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures perspective, as well as all of the structures at the university, it's very important to recognize that we are all role players mm -hmm. to enable the academic success of this institution, feeding into Vision 130, and really co-creating and collaborating so that we can make our academic profile stronger and our research profile stronger. So that's very important, and I just wanted to mm -hmm. sort of start so that everyone knows that we are all incredibly important stakeholders on this journey. Next slide, please. So in the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures, we really see that universities are integral part of the 4IR, 5IR, 6IR, etc. because it is a microcosm of society. Right? So it's a space that really emulates and represents all of the complexities that we have in a complex system. And what's interesting is that research now, and, and it's always been this case, but universities have moved into spaces where there are social and financial benefits. The financial benefits aren't there to make profit. It's there to ensure the sustainability of research so that we can continue doing better research for our society so that we can really take ourselves and our society to the next level. Think about us having a social good obligation to make sure that we feed into the social good of society and make sure that society ends up being a better place because of the work and the research we do. There's also a lot of potential for generating academic and scientific discourses. So this, this is not just about producing academic outputs. Academic outputs are vital because that is a way to consolidate information and have people build onto that knowledge. That's very important. But the discourses around it are also important. We want our students to talk about the research we produce. We want society to talk about it. We would like people out there to understand how much of the work we do impact them, right? So this is important, this bi-directional knowledge transfer between us and society and society back to us. This is very important. And then ultimately bringing scholars from various fields together. So often when we engage with our projects, we, you would find that you have a very technical piece of subject matter and a social scientist augment that work which is incredibly important. And as an interdisciplinary scholar, I cannot see a research project any other way. Next slide, please. So the aim of the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures and what it does is to really bring and immerse all of these social and non-social discourses around the digital, the future of knowledge, and the interdisciplinary nature of this work. You will understand that people building the apps people building the software and the algorithms might not necessarily be social scientists. So they might not necessarily calibrate the use cases of their technology. On the other hand, you might find an incredible technology in healthcare, but people need to ask what are the unintended consequences should this enter the healthcare space and disrupt the system too much. So those are the kinds of questions we, 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 we deal with. The ICDF strives to be a collaborative, co-creative space. Now, the collaboration and the co-creation we're talking about here is at a very intellectual level. And what is very important about this is that we cannot do it in isolation. Again, we partner up and work very closely with a variety of structures on campus. The e-research network, which Albert von Eyck is a part of, the Digital Scholarship Center, which Cornell Schaltman von Eyck is a part of. We all collaborate together around research projects and around these ideas to build this knowledge. And ultimately, the ICDF wants to take the lead in creating this fully emerged digital future so that we can have a socially responsive and relevant digital future. It's not just about throwing technology at a problem. You might find, this was quite an amazing finding, you might find that sometimes something as simple, and it's rather not simple, but something as straightforward as a slight policy change might have a much larger impact on a system than an innovative technology. So it's about really thinking about what is relevant and what is not. Where should we digitize, digitalize? Where should we incorporate digital technologies? Where shouldn't we? Where should we be human fundamentally and where should we not? So those are the, the big questions. Next slide, please. 
So within the interdisciplinary center, we really have um, two co-directors, one from more the natural sciences and one from the social sciences. And we, we report to different um, faculties, so, and, and um, uh, the, the UC Research and Internationalization, because we need multiple perspectives from different schools of thought. So it's not just one or two or three, but there's an entire committee that really drives the intellectual thinking around what it is that we implement. And everything we do, we cannot do in isolation. The academics that collaborate with us, the academic support structures that collaborate with us, all make this possible. So it's none of us as individuals standing there or smaller teams, but rather an institution-wide effort to work together so that we can drive this collective vision and feed into vision one thing. We have affiliations and secondments within part of our model, so sometimes we have people that are just affiliated with the interdisciplinary center through the form of a research project, and in other instances we second people for a certain amount of their time. So they, 25% of their time or 50% of their time, work within the interdisciplinary center and the other 50% within their respective faculty. Next slide, please. So, we talk about this thing often that we call digital science, right? And digital science is a big thing. And we mentioned this idea of what is a digital science minimum or essential. So when, when we say we immerse ourselves into digital science, what does that mean? So, next. So all of those things need to work together collectively. That's a little bit complicated. Some starts with your quantitative skills, but then immediately ethical skills. When we say ethical skills, we're literally talking about understanding the fundamental philosophies and all of the pillars of ethics and how that feeds into a project by project basis. The ethics are incredibly important to try and understand and mitigate the unintended consequences. Team player. We cannot do our work if people aren't willing to work with us. This is something that I think all of us have, have been exposed to and experienced to. We really want an army of the willing so that we can collaborate and build the institution. Lifelong learning. This one is important. Turns out, if you are the epitome of your field right now, so you're the best in your field right now, that does not mean that you're going to be the best tomorrow. So you need to consistently work on your lifelong improvement and engaging with your subject matter in ways that are incredibly responsive and innovative. Communication skills. Now let me just pause right here and just point this out. The mathematics and statistics that I showed on top is more your quantitative skills. All of the others up until this point are qualitative, humanistic and social skills. The future of research really needs this particular approach, where you have all of these dynamics coming in. Machine learning can be broken down into a multitude of different um, spaces. Data visualization, an incredibly important skill as well, because it turns out it's not just about making graphs. It's about making graphs so that other people can read it. Sometimes the information we work with is so complex that if I show it to you, you might not understand what it is that I'm trying to show you. So we're trying to simplify things. One of the projects that we have on Bakwa has to work with a, a variety of people that are both literate and illiterate. How do you present an ad to someone who cannot read? And that's a very good research question. And do you do it with pictures? Do you do it with colors? How do you make it intuitive so that if you give it to someone, they can use it? If we get to that point, does that mean we can give it to someone else in a different country where they don't even know any of the languages at all? Will they have the same kind of reaction? We don't know yet, but we're trying to figure these things out. Data wrangling and pre-processing. Libraries are really good with this. It has turned out that when it comes to a lot of information and making sure the information is packaged in a way and framed in a way that makes sense, this is work that you've done extensively. And to be able to translate that to actual skills within research beyond the scope of what it was intended for is probably the most exciting. And then finally, the ability to code <coughs> in a variety of different languages. Turns out coding is very similar to writing. You have to engage with it constantly. You can't just attend a writing workshop for one afternoon, get a certificate, and claim that you're now an author. 
It's something that you have to iteratively and consistently work on. And there's something beautiful about being able to elegantly write a piece of code that translates into something that seamlessly can be played on your phone. And that's quite nice. Next slide, please. I wanted to show just one, one or two, three highlights, really, of some of the things that we've done. So very important, what you're looking at on the screen, this was done through the grid-related research group. Head under the um, leadership of Dr. Jock Maritz, specifically around smart grid technology. This picture was taken this yesterday. And what you're looking at is the electricity consumption in real time on the hot block amps. So we are able to see per building how much people are using in terms of its electricity. Now, now comes an interesting question, and quite a behavioral question. And th these aren't my questions. They are, are laid out by the research team. They're asking questions like, if we tell people to switch off their geysers, or do not burn your kettle before load shedding, do they actually do that? And we find two schools of thought. Some people use as much energy as possible before load shedding, and some people say, you know what? This is my excuse not to work. So <laughs> it's a very interesting social dynamic that comes from something so quantitative. Also, the ability to see this in real time on your phone is quite powerful. Energy consumption and energy costs are massive within large institutions. And what is interesting is the next step of this work. Once we generate enough power, can we give power back to the community? So imagine there's load shedding in Kwakwa, which there is. And, and colleagues would recognize that when the power is off in Kwakwa, it's off for a while. Sometimes it could be days. Imagine if the university could generate power for those immediate communities. That's quite powerful. That puts the university at a very interesting space. Next slide, please. Some of the other local impacts that we have had is really trying to understand who are our people? Where do they come from? What do they talk about? And finding innovative ways to visualize this data beyond the scope of a traditional graph. I'm not saying that graphs are wrong. Graphs are very important, and they are tried and tested ways to illustrate certain kinds of information. But the more complex the information, the more intricate it needs to be to try and visualize it. So, so we play around with a lot of these. Next slide, please. At a provincial level within the free state context, we've done a lot of work extensively from COVID-19 modeling to a variety of other reports that ultimately feed its way into the government communication information system, the office of the ministers, as well as the presidency itself. To the extent that on a weekly basis we produce what is known as a social listening report for the office of the presidency. And what the ministers and the official communicators um, um, work on collectively through a multitude of different organizations, we're just a small slice of that large conversation, is to inform the health communication strategies for the following week. And that's quite powerful because that's a very interesting and innovative way to work with other stakeholders, other universities, and private and public institutions to try and do something for the greater good of society. Next slide, please. And then you can see that all of the vaccine reports that are being produced, we, we form a part of that. But we also study and try and understand things like social unrest. So what you're looking at on the right there are some of the sentiments around the looting that took place in KwaZulu Natal. We scraped the social media across seven different platforms of what people were talking about at that time, and we could provide insight into where there are risks and dangers in terms of human, human um, danger, just so that we could make sure to mitigate and manage the situation properly, and also understand the kinds of social unrest that exists. Are people looting for the sake of just looting, or is there a far larger outcry on a societal level in terms of resources? And that's a very important question, because we, we often look at social unrest and the damage that comes from it, but what is the outcry behind it? And that social element and social dynamic is vital to, to the work that we do. Last slide, please. And so to do this, we, we need to make impact on a variety of levels, publish articles in different spheres and domains, looking at some of the philosophy, looking at, for example, the global policy documents, how do people manage information differently? How are we managing data for social good in healthcare and in a variety of other domains? Next slide, please. 
I also just want to take this as a, a part that some of our members are active scholars in a variety of other spaces. Um, Dr. Susan Broken, Shaw Professor Edwin Kortzer, the head of the Department for Computer Science, and Dr. Berthet Sienekal recently published AI and Africa, Humanistic Perspective. Again, this is the work that they did within their particular research group, and it's just to showcase some of the incredible work that is going and taking place within the UFS space in this interdisciplinary AI space. Next slide, please. And so, I want to leave you with this idea, and it, it was a blank slide, <laughs> just so that there's nothing, so it's just a blank screen. I want to leave you with this, just so that you can think about the future of knowledge from this perspective. Within the Interdisciplinary Center of Digital Futures, and all the other structures on campus, from the Digital Scholarship Center, to the High Performance Computing Cluster, the academic faculties, the researchers, the students, and all the support staff on campus. We have a vision, and the Vision 130 is very clear, in terms of where we need to work towards strengthening this institution. But we collectively have a purpose to work together and hold hands to try and make this entire system function so that the future of knowledge and the future research we do is not only innovative, and there I take to the words of our director, innovation and academic innovation is very important. And, and, and please, never lose that passion, because that is absolutely true. But that we take that and harness it through these spaces. And the library is a pivotal part of that. So I just wanted to say thank you, colleagues, and I hope that you learned something about the interdisciplinary center. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. Um, let's give him a, again a round of applause. Uh, colleagues, we, we would uh, take questions uh, uh, at the so end. Of, the we will take questions at the end of the three presentation by the three units. Um, the next one is gonna, the next one is going to be. A presentation from the um, HPC, uh, which is the e-research unit within the university. We, we are one of the few universities in the country that has an HPC. Um, even our rich uh, neighbors in the, in, the, in the Cape, they had to come together. To, to to have an HPC. Um, UCT, Western Cape, Stellenbosch, CPUT, uh, along with uh, CSIR, uh, they they came together and have their HPC called ILIFU, and they accommodated our neighbors here from Salt Lake because of the research they do at the at the SK. Um, and 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 Probably other than us, it's it's UP and you and, and Vets that would would, but ours was one of was once a part of the nieces, and so our our researchers don't have to worry about the expertise when they are dealing with big data, but we 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 have it, and and um, the library can be proud that we, we played a role for that unit to remain open. There was a time when the university was thinking of closing because it's a very expensive uh, unit to run. But um, when we started with the discussion around digital scholarship center, um, uh, we, we, made an, we made an impact in such a way that we, we, we did make it known to the rectorate at the time the, the importance of serving such a unit within the university. So unfortunately, uh, uh, Albert is not in today, uh, but we are going to play a video so that you, you have an idea what this unit is all about. A round of applause for Albert. <laughs> performance computing was generally refers to the practice of aggregating computing power in a way that delivers much higher performance than one could get out of a typical desktop computer or workstation. It solves significant problems in science, 
engineering, or business. The term supercomputer or cluster is often used interchangeably to refer to an HPC. To appreciate and grasp the impact of an HPC, we unfortunately have to look at some technical aspects. We will keep it as simple as possible, but unfortunately some concepts are a bit more technical and more essential than others. To answer the question of what the difference between a personal computer and a high-performance computer is, in short, the overall size, scalability, complexity, and of course, cost of the system. Looking at the computer that you might be working on now, your computer will most likely only have one CPU, or also called the processor, with 8 to 16 CPU cores. In layman's terms, such a computer can optimally run between 8 and 16 software packages consecutively. Now, that is very theoretical, as we all know the frustration when you have, for instance, a specific software package that brings your computer almost to a halt. In a HPC, it's a bit different. A single machine usually has two or four physical CPUs, with 348 and 96 CPU cores. A machine in the HPC can therefore run 48 to 96 software processes consecutively. The software is also run much more effectively than on a personal computer due to a combination of hardware and operating system optimizations. Furthermore, the software on the HPC is compiled specifically for the hardware it runs on. This will be discussed a bit later. Other noticeable differences are the amount of memory that a single machine in the HPC has and the storage attached to the machines in the HPC. But those factors are of less importance to most researchers. However, a researcher from a scientific domain such as bioinformatics would not be able to run a specific software package on a personal computer due to the required system memory. These researchers also usually work with datasets up to tens of terabytes in size, which are usually stored on external hard drives and only copied when required. The final noticeable and critical difference is that most users use Microsoft Windows or Mac OS as an operating system on their desktops. In the HPC arena, Almost all HPCs globally run on GNU Linux distributions. This is an illustration of the fifth generation of HPC at the University of the Free State that was scheduled to be replaced by 2023. This system consists of three computer racks in which the various servers are mounted. The rack on the left holds the machines responsible to perform the scientific calculations and are referred to as compute nodes or simply nodes. This picture was taken before some additional nodes were added to the HPC, but one can see eight chassis in the bottom section. These graphical processing nodes each hold four general purpose graphical processing cards used for specific types of calculations, such as artificial intelligence or machine learning applications. Another two GPU nodes were also added after this photo was taken one of which has 8 GPU cores and 1 terabyte of system memory. The middle rack holds mostly storage devices, the bottom three chassis of storage trays known as JPods, with no calculation capacity and only housing hard drives. Each unit can hold 90 of the 3.5-inch form-factor hard drives. The storage is used for the researchers' home dormitories and scientific software installations of the HPC. Above these units are the storage nodes. These machines attach directly to the free hard drive units mentioned and create a distributed file system that can be used on all the machines in the system. Above that are some network switches facing backwards and the computer screen and keyboard. The computer screen and keyboards are only used during the initial setup and in the event of a system failure. Above that are two storage servers used for non HPC related research datasets. The rack on the right houses the management server and network managing servers. The yellow and blue network cables seen in the photo are only a fraction of the network cable in use. In the back of each machine are two pairs of network cables, one pair for management and another for the storage traffic. There is also one network cable for high throughput, low latency network and another for managing each physical machine. The HPC's power supply is backed by an uninterrupted power supply and the generator is not shown in this photo. The HPC is also located in a secure data center with sufficient cooling and fire suppression systems. As mentioned, in a HPC environment, the software is usually explicitly compiled according to the hardware, especially according to the CPU on which the software is intended to be run. By compiling software specifically for the hardware, the person installing the software tells the software indirectly which functions or capabilities of the CPU are available to be used. As a hypothetical and very simplistic example, imagine two CPUs are used to perform some calculations. 
for one CPU can now effectively only perform 10 multiplication calculations per cycle. For the CPU to work correctly, the large calculation has to be grouped into sets of 10, and then later the results are grouped yet again and multiplied together. In contrast, the other CPU might be capable of performing, say, 1000 multiplications per cycle. Both processes will return the same result at the end, but the calculation has to be performed differently to be effective. This example is very simplistic and hypothetical to illustrate how two CPUs might operate quite differently. But the software won't know what constraints or functions are available to use if it was compiled in a generic manner. This generic method is what you will find with any purchase software that you don't have access to the source code. That type of software may for instance require an Intel i5 CPU or even an i7 CPU. If it says the minimum requirement is an Intel i5 processor, then your code or software was basically compiled and optimized for an i5 or equivalent CPU. The software will run under your i7 or i9 CPU too, but it will have to assume that you only have an i5 and won't make use of the more advanced functions that your new processor may have. In a hypothetical example, the software will have to assume that it can only perform 10 calculations per cycle and therefore, the software will group all calculations into those restrictions instead of possibly executing a thousand operations per cycle that our CPU may be capable of. Again, our example is hypothetical only to illustrate our software is tied to the CPU hardware it thinks it might be running on. Some commercial software is compiled for more than one generation of CPUs but effectiveness thereof is sometimes lost when the CPU is detected incorrectly. It also increases the size and memory required for certain parts of the software, which increases the risk of the wrong system calls being executed on the CPU, which in turn increases the risk of system errors and total system failure. Moving slightly away from all the technical jargon, the HPC currently maintains over 300 different scientific software packages or versions of these packages. A researcher may for instance start a research project and three years later want to still be able to use the same version of the software. Meanwhile, another researcher may start using the same software packages but want to make use of the newer versions thereof. On most computer systems, this will create a clash between the different versions of the software. On the HPC, both researchers are accommodated by simply modifying their environments on the fly. Each version of a specific software package is also explicitly compiled for the hardware it will run on. In the current HPC environment, there are three different hardware architectures. This means each software package is potentially compiled for the three different system configurations and potentially different operating systems and versions G. For any scientific software, multiple software dependencies exist. For instance, a software package might require a specific version of, say, OpenAPI. The installed version of OpenAPI on the operating system might possibly not be compatible with the software. Then the specific version of OpenAPI will first have to be compiled. OpenAPI has its own dependencies, such as the specific version of Python or GCC. GCC and Python in turn have their own dependencies, which might have further dependencies. Therefore, to install a single scientific software package, one might have to install tens of other software packages and link them all together. This task should not be the concern of a researcher, but this is usually a massive constraint why researchers struggle to install specific software themselves. For specific research domains and pipelines, software containers were created. A container is basically an operating system installation with the required software pre-installed in. These containers can run on top of the running operating system, but the software and processes are isolated from each other. This allows the systems engineers to create containers with multiple software packages installed on newer or older operating systems that a specific software may require without needing to reinstall the machine whenever the software is required. This in turn allows researchers to run software that might be a bit old and require an operating system that is no longer supported. All of this is taken care of by the HPC systems engineers. As mentioned, there are over 300 software packages installed on the HPC. In an attempt to document the usage of each software package, the HPC team started documenting sub-processes on a public available website, docs.hpc.ufs.ac.za. Feel free to visit the website and have a look at the specific software that you intend to run. 
Fortunately, documenting the use of all the 300 software packages and the additional 60 containers and their own software in the containers is not an easy task, but the site will grow over time. The HPC also provides annual training sessions, which are listed on the events website mentioned here. Let's look at some of the research performed on the HPC. The University of the Free State has an Illumina Next Generation Sequencer. To illustrate but simplify the whole process of sequencing, we will not go into too much detail about this process itself, but rather have a broad overview of the process. Researchers now know that the human genome is over 3 billion base pairs long. This means a human genome can be described using a combination of nucleic acid sequences. Looking at next generation sequencing, you may ask why would you need to run an analysis on an HPC rather than on a regular desktop computer. If a researcher is sequencing a yeast genome at 100 times coverage, you are looking at a dataset of about 10 gigabytes of storage while the analysis runs. This is not much in storage requirements of data, but one must remember that the whole sequencing must happen in memory while the job is running. If the computer on which the job is running has less than the required memory available, then the memory will have to be read from the hard drive into the active memory and back multiple times while the job is executing. If we're looking at the human genome, which has over 3 billion genome pairs at 100 times coverage, we are looking at a system with about 3 terabytes of data storage requirements. Again, the less memory the machine has, the more times the data will have to be read into and out of memory during processing. Finally, when looking at some plant genomes, many species have more than 100 times the amount of genome base pairs compared to the human genome. With these datasets, you are looking at about 300 terabytes of storage, which must be transferred into and out of memory. This is a mammoth task for any existing computer system, even an HPC. Getting a little more into the sequencing method itself, there are four nucleoside bases called adenine, cytosine, guanine, and pyramine. First, the sample is taken from a source and isolated. This sample is then added into a solution that breaks down the DNA into more minor base pairs. The next gen sequencer produces millions of short 100 to 300 base pairs. The results of the sequencer are analyzed using a reassembling algorithm. This diagram shows how some of the 100 to 300 base pair shear DNA reads are realigned using an algorithm to reassemble these millions of reads into a reconstructed genome. Looking at the workings of the algorithm itself, it basically takes the smaller base pairs and compares them to each other, looking for overlapping sequences, cambers. The cambers are reconstructed into a more extended sequence. In this example, we look at how few five base pair cambers are compared to start with a small sequence, adding a corresponding sequence that overlaps with the set sequence. In this example, we have three cambers with the precise sequences of A, T, G, C, and G. Then, we found three cameras that overlap with the original cameras, but an additional C or cytosine at the end of the pair. This algorithm therefore knows that the base pair starts with an A, D, G, C, G, C, G, G, A, 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 and so on and so on, to get to the resulting simple genome sequence. <laughs> Each of these cameras must be stored in memory at some stage until the whole sequencing is complete. Therefore, a lot of memory is required for this type of assembly. This methodology generates many assemblies and the scientists must choose the best one. This graph shows multiple assemblies that have been tried to determine the correct assembly at the end of the run. Eastern terminal domains are indispensable to many current and related cellular processes such as transcription, DNA repair and apoptosis. A study that investigates the position, interaction and structure of these and terminal domains within the nucleosome core particle using long time scale molecular dynamics was performed by a researcher at the University of the Free State. The researcher first investigated the model of the nucleosome core particle with 180 base pairs of DNA based on the structure of the tetranucleus and obtained 500 nanoseconds molecular dynamics trajectory of the system to use as a reference in subsequent simulations. The structure, interactions and location of the eastern tiles within a nucleosome with additional linker DNA were investigated on the initial nucleosome core particle with 634,718 atoms. 
The circulation ran for 86 days on 192 CPU cores. Thereafter, the effect of linker instant subtypes on the dynamics of the histone terminal domains in the nucleus and core particle model was investigated. Three simulations were performed. The first model had 823,924 atoms and ran on the HPC for 38 days using 300 CPU cores. The second model had 622,844 atoms and was executed for 33 days on 1,350 CPU cores. The third model, with 962,281 atoms, was executed for 41 days using 300 CPU cores. Finally, the effect of post-translational modification on the dynamics of the histone terminal domains in a nucleus or core particle model system was investigated. These simulations were run on the two separate models. Both models had 765,655 atoms. Each simulation took 37 days on 1,350 CPU cores. The figures displayed here represent the clustered structures of the histone terminal domains over the 500 nanoseconds molecular dynamic simulation. The most populated structures of the histone H3 in terminal domains for chain A on the left and chain E on the right are displayed here. Overall, Six 500 nanoseconds molecular dynamic simulations were performed to obtain a total of 3 microseconds of simulation time of the nucleus of core particle. The unique positions of the naked DNA arms can be observed in this shortened video clip. The total time spent running the computer simulations for this study was 272 days. These simulations used over 4.4 million CPU hours. If one had to run these simulations on a desktop computer with 16 CPU cores, the simulations would take over 31 years to complete. The application of such a study is more evident when one realizes that many of the major diseases affecting human health, such as cancer, HIV AIDS, and malaria, have been shown to have a basis in chromatin structure and function. Let's look at an application that uses multicolor simulations. A Monte Carlo simulation is a mathematical technique used to estimate an outcome of a given but uncertain process. On the left hand side of this presentation, you see a positron emission tomography scanner, or simply known as a PET CT scanner that most of us will recognize. This type of scanner can be purchased for about 1.6 million rand. The cost of the reagents required to operate such a scanner is about 4,000 rand per day. This excludes the amount of radiation that is produced while using the scanner and the amount of electricity required to operate such a scanner. On the right hand side, we see a computer modeled 8 slices PET scanner used in an application named GATE. This model is available to use at no cost and can be used to simulate the interaction of electrons and positrons when using a PET CT scanner to treat patients. At the bottom right hand of this presentation, you will notice a small computer representation of an object inside the PET scanner. This is a model of a rat in a scanner. The physical counterpart of the scanner is available for purchase, but costs 10 times more than the regular size scanner used to treat humans. These smaller scale scanners are only used for research purposes, and thus, only a few universities will opt to purchase such a scanner. Let's look at how Monte Carlo methods are applied to produce a computer modeled CT image. First, we start with what we call a phantom. A phantom is an object created out of several parts with different densities to represent different types of body tissue. In this example, we observe a model that is made out of perspex that has different tubes that run from front to back. This model represents a human torso, where the pipes through the model can represent different organs or bones, depending on the density of the material in the tube. By performing an actual PET scan of our phantom, we get a high resolution image on the right. This image represents a cross-section scan of part of our phantom. This blue and black image with some red and other colored spots represents the density differences of the materials used to construct the phantom. In the image on the right, you may notice a purple outline around the so-called organs and the phantom itself. This is the first bit used to construct the phantom and could represent organ tissue matter, such as skin in this case. Now, a multicolor simulation is used to predict the outcome of the PET scan using a specific computer model of a scanner, which has the exact specifications of the physical scanner that was used. After several multicolor simulations, the image on the right was created. You may notice some of the so-called organs appearing in this image, but it is very faint. The outline of the phantom is noticeable and is comparable to what the actual PET scan in the model looks like. However, 
The resolution is insufficient for an indistinguishable comparison between the computer simulation and the real world PET scan. The simulation must continue to get the 5 to 1 resolution of the PET scan. In this image, the picture on the bottom right was derived from multiple Monte Carlo runs. We see that the resolution is better and that the organs appear to be more defined than the picture just above it. But this image is still not close enough to the real world picture obtained by an actual PET scan. We will push our simulation further by simply running more and more Monte Carlo simulations on our model. Finally, after running a lot of Monte Carlo simulations, we get the image at the bottom left. This image is comparable with the observed PET scan image right above it. You will notice some discoloration around the phantom that appear to be whiter than the physical scan, but this is due to the uncertainty of the material that the perspex represents. You may ask how the computer program knows what the phantom looks like, or where the positions of the organs are. The picture on the bottom left shows a computer simulation of our phantom. This is what we refer to as a voxelized model, which is a three-dimensional representation of the physical object or material. The software package provides some known material that is used in the industry to make phantoms. For instance, you may add an object to the phantom that is made out of wood. The program will then know what the properties of wood are, and will simulate an accurate interaction between the wood and the simulated radiation to get a picture of what is to be expected. Some human phantoms are freely available that have all the organs with their estimated positions and properties. These phantoms can then be used to simulate how cancer cells will react to certain isotopes during a PET CT scan. One restriction, however, is the movement of organs that occurs as a patient is inhaling and exhaling. This movement can currently not be simulated using the existing phantoms and software, but studies are conducted to compensate for these movements. As a final example, we observe how fluid dynamics was used when simulating the jet stream of Messier 87. Messier 87, also known as Burger A, or NGC 4486, is a supergiant elliptical galaxy, almost twice the diameter of the Milky Way. It was discovered by a French astronomer, Charles Messier, in 1781, and is located about 54 million light years from Earth, in the constellation Virgo. It is one of the most massive galaxies in the observable universe and has a large population of globular clusters, about 12,000, compared to the 150 to 200 orbiting the Milky Way. At the center of M87 is an active galactic nucleus, which consists of a supermassive black hole activity taking in material from the surrounding galaxy. In 1978, stellar dynamical modeling of the mass distribution of M87 gave evidence of a central mass of 10 to the power of 14 kilograms, or 5 billion solar masses. This means that the core of M87 has the equivalent mass of 5 billion suns, which is a thousand times more than the supermassive black hole at the center of our own Milky Way. In 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope took an image of the core of M87, which was the first ever direct image of a black hole. The image shows the black hole's shadow caused by the gravitational bending of space time, along with the surrounding matter accreting onto it. M87 has another strange feature. In 1918, Robert Curtis noted the presence of a curious straight ray seemingly connected to the nucleus of M87. This ray is in fact a relativistic jet stream of energetic plasma formed matter ejected from the center of the galaxy by the supermassive black hole. The plasma inside this jet travels at velocities close to the speed of light and spans over 4,500 light years. The energetic plasma also radiates light over the entire electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves up to gamma rays. The flow and force of the energetic plasma moving through this jet stream has been simulated on the HPC using fluid dynamics. This illustration shows the simulated density of the flow for such a jet stream. The simulation ran for more than 18,000 CPU hours on the HPC and also used around 200 gigabytes of memory while it was running. It also generated 88 gigabytes of data files to generate a small video clip. <coughs> to conclude, the first HPC on campus was created to relieve a researcher from the burden of having to spend months attempting to install scientific software themselves. That still holds true today, with a researcher recently admitting that they intended to install a specific software package for the better part of a year. The software was installed by an HPC team member in a matter of weeks and is now available to run on a single machine, multiple machines or GPU servers. 
Sometimes, the scientific problem is either too difficult to solve in the real world, or it may simply not be possible or affordable to perform in the real world. For example, observing the galaxies and the gravitational forces between celestial bodies is not within the capacity or equipment budget of most research institutes. However, on an HPC, a researcher can use existing datasets to examine and observe these interactions. On a molecular scale, a researcher can observe the interaction of elements with each other, or even observe the effect of a quantum leap. This can be used to create new compounds and medicines, cutting the cost and time spent on trial and error laboratory experimentation drastically. Some researchers may face health and ethical considerations when conducting their experiments. For instance, a researcher will not ethically be allowed to experiment on humans or animals to monitor how a cancer cell reacts to different high energy treatments. One can simply not give a patient the amount of radiation required during a study, without the patient suffering healthy cell deterioration or even fatal complications. Using different imaging methods, a researcher can significantly assist with the monitoring, behavior, and eventually treatment of tumors. In other cancer-related research, machine learning can be used, for instance, to identify certain breast cancer growths from mammograms well in advance. A researcher will not be allowed to conduct experiments with dangerous and radioactive materials without the necessary laboratory at their disposal and following strict safety precautions. Again, the availability and cost of certain materials are also a burden to research. Another need for an HPC is the analysis of next-generation sequencing or other massive datasets. Studying a human conducted virus or bacteria found 2 kilometers underground without sequencing in computer A is impossible. Some calculations can be done on the desktop computer, but when a complex enzyme is investigated, even a supercomputer takes months to compute. It is sometimes impossible to switch off the computer or use it for other purposes while the calculation is being performed. This is a massive challenge for most, especially the load shedding. In certain science domains, some workflows are relatively easy to automate and build pipelines for others to follow. This allows a researcher to use a predefined methodology known to work and must only focus on analyzing the results to conclude with their own findings. All the examples, and many more, have been performed on the HPC. We would like to invite you to become part of the HPC research community. Please contact us if you believe you may benefit from using the HPC. Um, one, 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 one of the criticism that we, we normally hear amongst the commentators recently is that there is a large uh, research output that is not consistent with um, uh, um, the, the input from, from academics. But you, you can see that now uh, researchers can actually process data much faster. What would take them days, even months, now they can do in minutes or even in seconds. So why? So that explains the rationale about our research output, why it's increasing at such high rate. Uh, colleagues, we, we are running a little bit uh, out of time, uh, behind time. Uh, at this stage, we would call uh, Ms. Cornell uh, Skelchema Panvik. She She's a deputy director responsible for Digital Scholarship Center here at the library um, to complete the three presentation by the... I almost say three mascots, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Yes, I must say that um, every time that I listen to um, the ICDF or the HBC, then I'm quite blown away by, by everything that, that they do. Um, but Albert mentioned something, you know, lightening the burden for, um, for researchers, and I think that is exactly what we at the library also want to do, um, and at the Digital Scholarship Centre. Um, because we're moving into a more digital environment, more and more, um, just to, to give you a chance to, to focus on, on your research. Mm. Um, so, yes, I'll tell you a little bit about our, um, the support services specifically within the Digital Scholarship Centre. Um, 
if you can just go to the next slide, please. I just want to plug the Research and Scholarly Communications Training Program, um, where uh, we have um, different trainings um, that assist you throughout the research cycle, um, advanced information searching, so um, during your literature review, but also systematic and scoping reviews. Bibliometrics and altmetrics um, supporting you as a researcher in tracking the impact of your of your research, but also um, looking at the metrics of the journals that you want to publish in. Just two quick examples. Um, altmetrics um, looking more at your societal impact um, through um, the mentions around the, the conversations online um, around your research. All things open access, supporting you in, in um, uh, where to publish, um, how to approach open access, um, the pitfalls, the benefits, um, all of that. Uh, a very nice one that we have, um, if you could just go back, sorry. <laughs> very nice one that we have is uh, digital researcher identities. Um, so managing, if, if, if somebody searches you on the internet, um, they're going to believe what they see. Uh, so managing that identity, the best practices around it, your ORCID IDs, researcher IDs, things like that. We support research data management, um, data management planning, um, and then, of course, um, digital scholarship. Thank you. So just a quick uh, explanation of digital scholarship. It's nothing uh, uh, new in the sense of um, the research that you're already doing. It's just in a digital environment. So we have all these digital tools and platforms and processes that make it really easy for us to do, no, easier for us to do our research. Um, but the other element of digital scholarship is a networked environment, so the internet. If you just think about open access, it's the internet that allows us to provide open access to research output, and we wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise. Um, and then openness plays a big part in digital scholarship. Um, the caveat is always as open as possible, as close as necessary. So if we talk about openness in digital scholarship, um, just keep that in mind. Not everything can, can be made fully open, but making things more open, your research process, your research practices, uh, methods, um, it's, it's good research practice to start with, and um, it just makes uh, your, your process more transparent. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a quick infographic on um, the Digital Scholarship Center. Um, so one of the, the biggest reasons for the Digital Scholarship Center is that we already have so much expertise at the university. Um, you've heard that now, Charlie's mentioned it as well, that, um, but you need to find it. You need to know that it's there. So the goal then of the Digital Scholarship Center when we started it is to not only expand the capacity of the university so that we have new ways of doing research um, and scholarship, but also to be this one place where researchers can come to, um, to be connected with the right person, support person, the right support service um, at the right time. Um, so really providing that accessible, um, consistent and discoverable support. Um, that you have. And in that way, we do try to lighten the burden because you might not know where to go. Your promoter or study leader might not know exactly um, where you can find the resources. But being this kind of hub um, that goes out to all the different uh, support services, the faculties, um, it gives us a view of the research environment at the university that can only help you um, because we know how to connect you to the right um, to the right services. Um, so yeah, a, a one-stop shop that we try to do. Okay, so I mentioned that we support you throughout the research um, life cycle, and I just want to give you a few examples in the digital environment of how we support you um, with your research. So obviously a big part of what you're going to do in your research project is the planning. And the library has so many digital resources available to you. One example is Sage Research Methods. So this is a, a, a database, if I can call it that, subscription, um, with academic 
uh, material that can help you decide what will your methodology be, what kind of tools are you going to use. Um, but instead of just Googling it and you know, then scrambling to find academic material to support that when you write that up in your, in your methodology um, chapter, SAGE Research Methods, it has the academic content. It also has a very easy way to cite, so you just click on it, copy the citation, and, and you have it. Um, so the, the subscriptions that the library has to databases and journals, I mean, that is really uh, uh, very valuable um, um, to you. Also, a big part of, of planning is looking at your research data. So um, we provide support in research data management on how to set up your data management plan. But it's a lot easier to do that right at the beginning of your project. And the reason why we support it um, very heavily is that if you've got funder requirements um, that, that ask you to have a data management plan but you're not sure, we can help with that. But the thing is that even if you don't have a requirement for a data management plan, when you get to the end of your project, let's say you publish your article and you get queries, then it's easy to go back to that specific version of your data set because you planned to have the different versions and then you can easily defend your um, your research um, that are based on, on, on the data. So instead of scrambling at the end to get certain things, you just have it in place at the beginning. Um, and then we also support um, research data collection tools and software like Eversys um, and RedCap. The library subscribes to NCAP, the full suite um, for, for referencing. So um, like I said, so many digital tools um, available to you. So when you get to the discover phase, I mentioned the advanced information searching training that we give, um, but you've got your research librarians and your faculty librarians to support you there as well. Um, so many electronic databases and journals, and we even have a tool, um, we call it a discovery tool, where you can do one search, like a Google search, but it searches everything that we have. So books, journals, paper, electronic, absolutely everything. Um, we can also help you in finding, if you're not going to collect your own data, in finding existing data sets, um, or if you want to combine data sets with others with your own, we can help with that as well. Um, when it comes to your, your data analysis, um, let's say, and again, this is the, the idea of the Digital Scholarship Center, is that you can come to us and we can kind of help you find what you need. Uh, well, not kind of, we can. Um, but uh, let's say there's specific equipment that you need to gather your data or specific software, um, but you don't know how to go about getting it or it's really expensive. Maybe we know of somebody in your discipline at the university that already has the equipment. So we can facilitate sharing of the equipment. Um, if we have a very long list of approved and supported software, research software at the university, let's say the one that you're looking for doesn't fall under that list, but it's really crucial for you to use that specific tool, then we can help facilitate um, access to, to that, if it is at all possible. Um, and then also you've got like the statistical unit and mathematical sciences um, that we can connect you with, or in health sciences, the biostatistics department that help with data analysis. Um, so lots of support there. And we also continuously, when we connect with faculty, with research teams, we continuously look at new digital tools that are out there, or maybe not that new, but new to us, and try and um, promote that as much as possible. So when it comes to, to writing and, and, and publishing, um, there are lots of support for writing at the Center for Graduate Support, um, at CTL, um, in various different places. Um, but we can also help you in deciding where to publish. So I mentioned open access. I have a few issues. Open access allows more questionable and, and predatory publishing practices. Um, not that it's uh, uh, exclusive to open access, but yeah, so helping you avoid that. Um, I mentioned the EndNote um, referencing subscription that we have. Um, but we have a very, very nice tool called Fidelior 
uh, that will really help you during the writing process and the publishing process. And what Fidelio does is you can um, search for a specific journal that you're interested in publishing, for example, and it'll tell you it's listed in all these accredited lists, so you're good to go. But it can also flag, well, it was removed from this list uh, with a reason, maybe, you know, uh, bad uh, editorial practices. Um, so having that flag might prevent you from publishing in a predatory or a, a journal that isn't up to standard anymore. Um, but the nice thing about Fidelio is you can also upload a whole reference list. So if, if you're busy with your, um, your article, your thesis, your dissertation, if you're a study leader or a promoter and you need to check um, your student's work, you upload the whole reference list and you get a, um, a report that does exactly that, but with every single reference that is listed. So that is very, very useful as you go through your writing process, not to cite resources, uh, base your biggest arguments on these resources, and then at the end of it, um, you realize, okay, you need to find um, um, other resources, other sources. Um, we also have an open access publications fund that support the publishing in open access. Uh, 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 journals. Um, all of the links are on the slides, so um, you will you will get them. Um, if you look at then sharing um, the impact, um, so we have so many tools available to you to connect with other researchers, um, to distribute your your work to a wider audience. I mentioned the online identity training because that also helps you connect and. Uh, uh, make people more aware of the work that you're doing. Um, we also um, support scientific communication, so if you want to, I almost want to say translate your academic article to something more accessible to the public, we work closely with the marketing and communication department at the university to, to help you do that. So yes, throughout the research cycle, just a few examples, but, but many more available. Um, so these are just, this is just a list of all the different services that we have, and of course they all have little babies. Um, I can just also mention that we do work with the Center for Universal Access and Disability Support to acquire assistive technologies. Um, so things like document readers, um, communication devices, um, so if you're ever in a situation um, where you need assistive technologies, um, or want some advice, you're welcome to contact us. Um, we also support digital publishing. So the library um, hosts the academic, accredited academic journals of the university, the Gussi journals. But we also support um, other journals um, and all different types of publishing, um, open access books, um, etc. Um, we can also help you with uh, digital preservation advice. Um, so not only in terms of, let's say, you have a collection that you want to digitize um, uh, and uh, preserve the physical um, versions and the digital versions, um, but also with, for example, research data. So if you know that your research data set needs to be accessible still in 20 years, that's a little bit difficult. I mean, three years? Maybe you'll be okay, maybe you'll still be able to open it. But things change so fast um, with technology that you don't know if you'll be able to do that in 20 years. So then we can give you advice, we can show you ways of, of preserving that data. Um, we work with so many different support services units, as I said. Uh, one of them is the... Um, <laughs> Center for Development Support. Um, they have um, a lovely program um, around digital storytelling. So if digital storytelling is part of your, your research project or maybe you want to use that um, as a way to communicate your, your work, we can connect you with them and set up some, some training there as well. Uh, we have platforms for digital exhibitions or collections. Um, so again, if you have uh, a Digital, digital humanities, for example, would use that um, um, to uh, display um, digital collections. 
We have a lovely data visualization wall in the, in the center. Um, if you are interested in just having another type of view on your research data. So having that, that big view gives you, um, you see things that you wouldn't see on your small laptop screen. So um, that's bookable um, if you want to come and use that. I mentioned the research data management support um, and anything in open science, the broader open science environment. So if you are interested in opening up a little bit more of your research process, um, the methods, tools, um, we can help you with that. And um, all within the university's policies and um, ethical considerations. Um, yes, so be available for consultation sessions, um, training one-on-one -on -one or in groups, or just facilitating training for something specific. And we do have a space, if you can just go one slide, it's actually just next door, um, aimed at your academics and your researchers that does not have another place quiet and hopefully inspirational where they can sit and just work. A video conferencing um, table, some booths, uh, if you're interested in uh, um, creating digital content. Um, we are setting up a, a recording studio on level five here in the library. But in the meantime, those booths have quite the acoustic, so um, they, will, they can do it. Sorry, you can go on to the next slide. Okay, um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we connect with um, a lot of support services and faculty. Um, this is just a list of kind of main um, support services um, that we connect with. So we, we want to keep up to date with all the different processes at the university that somehow involve research. And that's why finance is in there, um, student admin services, because we do need to get that whole picture to better help you um, do your research. Okay, so um, I've provided you a guide with a link to all the UFS supported software um, and approved software. It's a very long list, but there might still be things that, you, that you're interested in. Welcome to let us know. And that's the same link that, that Albert also shared on his presentation to the HBC. Um, just to give you an idea, we support the digital publishing with open journal systems, with open monograph press. We've got the African Languages Press on open monograph press. Um, but we also assist with uh, publishing the open access book, books. Um, we investigate platforms like Scalar, that's more an interactive type of publishing uh, content publishing platform. Just to see, would it fit in with the UFS uh, um, environment? Could it work better? Um, Omega S is the digital exhibition platform. Our archive for contemporary affairs, which is also, of course, a, a lovely resource that you can use depending on your, your, your study area, um, uses access to memory. But if you're interested in starting a blog, um, an academic blog, let's say, um, we can help you with that. What are the best platforms to use? What are the best practices? How, how do you approach it? Um, social media as well. It's, it's a minefield sometimes. I mean, Twitter is now X. Thread is part of Instagram. I don't know. But we can help you with that. Um, just to, to help you decide which platforms you can best use. And so on. Thank you. Um, I mentioned the scientific communication. Uh, one example is that the university has a collaboration with the Conversation Africa. But that's just one of the media outlets that, that they um, regularly use to distribute. And we have a lovely guide on, on tips on how to um, translate your, your academic article. Um, there is a digitization unit at the, at the library under the Research and Scholarly Communications Division. So um, can do lots of things. Um, we'll probably get another time, Charlie, to brag about, about that. But so if you have analog research data and you need that digitized, again, welcome to contact us. 
and all of the links to um, the guides, the resources um, that I spoke about, and to our social media pages as well. So um, we have lots of events that are recorded and shared on the social media, so if you missed out, great way to catch up. And a plug for the mobile app. Um, it is digital, after all, so please don't forget about the digital app, uh, the, the mobile app, uh, where you can access everything that the library provides. Um, uh, just from your, your mobile phone. Okay. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for Prabhla. Um, thank you very much um, to, to the three colleagues um, from HPC, ICDF, and DSC. Uh, you know, when you get acronym, you must know you're in the life. Um, we, are, we, we, are, we are a house of acronyms. Colleagues, um, we've got about 12 minutes. We will take a, a round of questions. Uh, if there's any specific questions, and then in the next session, we'll be starting immediately at 11 where we are going to um, have a panel of our, some of our researchers that we have already profiled. Um, I'll give you a background around that when we, when we have done with the questions. Unfortunately, uh, um, uh, Hercules, Hercules had to leave um, uh, due to engagement and, and, and uh, Albert is not here, but um, these three units have been working together. So we should be able to answer all the, uh, all the questions that you might have that uh, you wanted to pose, whether it's for HPC or it's for ICDF or DSC. So I'm opening up the floor for questions. I can see all of you. I eat carrots, so if you raise your hand, I should be able to see. Um, first round. Going once. Mike. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for those wonderful uh, presentations. I have a question for um, the Digital Scholarship Center. Um, keep for example, we have students that want to use a software that is um, they found maybe on the internet, and it's not something that it's common that we use on campus. Can we ask them to come to you to see whether they can as you can assist? So yeah, absolutely. Um, what happens is that um, depending on the type of data that they're collecting, depending on the requirements, um, compliance with, with legalities, uh, with POPIA and all of that, um, all of the approved systems um, at the university or software already accounts for that. Um, so you know that if you use it, you're complying with all of those, with, with the legislation. So if it's something that they found on the internet, yeah, absolutely. Um, if I don't um, immediately know, okay, like, Google Forms to collect your data is definitely not good practice. Um, but if it's something that I don't know, then I can connect with ICT. So it kind of takes that, I'm your middleman. Um, you don't have to connect with ICT. You don't know, have to know their processes and, and their application forms and all of that. I can do that for you. Another question? Thank you very much for the presentations. Um, I wanted to check um, if maybe one is interested in downloading that particular software that you said uh, will make it easier for us to be able to check referencing. How can we be able to access that? Um, yes, um, you're welcome to, to send me an email. Um, I'll, we'll, we'll share all of the details again after the sessions um, with everybody here. Um, what I do then is I contact our vendor and I just say, you just log into Fidelior, I'll send you the instructions, 
log into Fidelia or our Let Our Vendor Know, please include you in our um, subscription. And then we'll assign you with, let's say, 15 reports that you can, can draw because the searching for an individual title, journal title, is you can do that as many times as you want. Um, but you do need uh, report credits to upload the full reference list. And if you use that 15, you need more, you just let us know. What? Are you also referring to the reference <coughs> tool or the, the one that you can check with the database? Yeah, I think it's both. Yeah, so, so yeah, with EndNote, um, you can actually uh, contact ICT directly. They also have all the installation files and instructions um, to install it on your computer for you. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, my question is based on the digital and environment platforms. Uh, Cornell having mentioned uh, the digital environment platforms, which includes the databases, the serials, and so on and so on. I just want to ask the archi archives and the uh, Africana connection is not part of the digital environment. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, we can hear. Okay, so um, that is uh, one of the projects um, that the library is working on under the broader UFS digi digitalization plan um, to digitize, um, especially your, your heritage collections. Um, in Africana, in, in the archive, and have that as much as we can make it available, and have that available online in a digital environment. Thank you. Oh, there's the uh, prof. Do we end the one? All right. Yeah, thank you, Cornell. Uh, perhaps if you allow me, Chair, uh, the first thing is uh, a compliment. You know, I've been, I've been in HUFS for a while. But one of the things, I don't know what you do between you, Director, and, and the Deputy Directors. Uh, I have not seen people that are root at library. Like where we in other spaces. And I hope you will, you will share what you do with your colleagues so that this space is welcoming. Maybe some may have seen them, but my experience, everyone is always available. If it's on short time, you ask for this, everyone is always willing to fly and help. That's very good of the, the library. Thank you for so much. That's a compliment. I thought I should say it here. Well done, library. All right, um, uh, Cornell, you, I know you, you, you're so passionate about uh, digital scholarship and, and you have done quite a lot. I just want to find out that you have such a brilliant programs that you have. And there are certain academics that don't come forth. And most of the times, especially us in management, one of the things that you will hear, they will say, we don't have support. And we always try to dismantle that because such things have been invited, people don't come. You do this, people don't come. There is, and at the end of the day, when you want to do performance appraisal, people tell you there is no support. So I want to then find out what could the strategy then from, from the library and office to say, we take these programs to the faculties perhaps coming to the library um, seems to be scary or, and so on. What could be done perhaps to say, we come back to the faculties and so on. I, I, I'm not sure if my question uh, is clear, but a, a way of us, instead of us coming in here, how then can you take a turnaround approach to say, okay, now we are bringing the library to you. Thank you. Yeah, oh. you can start direct. 
thank you so very much, Prof, uh, and for the compliment. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for making that call. Uh, I think you will see with our first initiative, we wrote to the faculties where we are advocating for our transformative agreement agreements and, and respective departments have been inviting us to come and share with them. So I think maybe we'll have to combine and then uh, our, 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 our programs and processes so that when we visit departments, we don't only talk about uh, transformative agreements, we include everything else that will ensure that we support our, our researchers because we have these tools, we have the skills. So if we, if we package them together, then I think we are going to kill uh, five bees with one stone. Thank you. Yeah, um, what we... What we are planning currently, like the director has indicated, we are already uh, getting invites into, to speak on transformative agreement. What we had agreed in principle is that after this launch, we will be sending out letters again um, to, to individuals. The transformative agreements, we are sending it out to the heads to invite us to, to, to share with them in their, in their department, departmental meetings. But with the, with the, with, with the outreach to researchers who are going to send out to individuals. So we will be sending out a letter that asks specific questions. We are going to, in that letter, we'll be asking plus minus 10 questions. And if you would say um, no in any of the 10, you can invite us to speak to that to where you said no. So, so we are making it um, one, like most of the resources that we've got here. For instance, one of the, one of the things that we have discovered is that the, some researchers are doing extremely well, but they are not recognized. And the question could be, is that they are, not they are not recognized because they have not recognized themselves that they are doing well. So we want to come and say to you, look, we are doing well. This is how your profile looks like if you were going to apply for, 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 for rating. So it, 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 it's, it's going to happen. So you will be re uh, receiving invite very soon. Not necessarily an invite, but a letter that tells you that we would like to visit you if you have answered no in any of the questions that we're going to ask you. Or if you've got an interest in knowing more on the tools that we have. Um, that, is the, that is the vision we've taken uh, as part of the new uh, library uh, strategic plan that now uh, Mohammed is going to the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. Uh, that would conclude exactly at 11 the 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 session on on the, the three uh, units that uh, collaborate working together to support research at the university uh, now we are coming to the reason why we are here in the first place uh, this is an overall research symposium it's going to happen um, if I can give you a background, when we started with this project, our intention was to profile one researcher, two researchers in a month. So, by, meaning bi-weekly, we would profile a researcher. So, our intention is that by now, we would have interviewed at least eight researchers. Okay? That's our target. Bye. Currently, we have interviewed 60 researchers. It exceeded my expectation. It exceeded director's expectation. It, it exceeded my, the team that is doing. And it's only, not only did we interview the researchers, 
But what we have then realized, there was a value add. Because when you interview somebody, then you realize that you actually, when you, we were not aware of what we already have at the university. So what we have done uh, after the interviews, in some instances, we went to the lecturers where they operate in their labs. And then now we are profiling their labs. Because remember, with Vision 130, you want to increase the, the, the number of postgraduate in our university. So if they know that there is an infrastructure that they can support there, we, we would likely to get more prospective m and So you, you would see going forward, we are not only going to end with the researchers themselves, but we're also profiling the, 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 their laboratories, their, their research environment, um, so we will be knocking again, based on what we would have found as we interview researchers. That um, So without a waste of time, I would like to introduce to you our panel for today. First one is Professor Abdin Atangana. Um, Prof, if you are here, you can come to the front. Um, Prof Atangana uh, is from NAS. Uh, he will be one of the panel members. Our uh, next panel member is Prof. Dube, Peggy Temba. Uh, Prof, you can come. <laughs> Our next panel researcher is Dr. Kosa. Uh, she was the first this morning, <laughs> um, and uh, I was like wond um, wondering where our colleagues are. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kosa from the Kita. And then Prof. El Marikutse. <laughs> Dr. Mohatlani. We are supposed to be joined by Professor Asha from Kwakwa campus. He was going to join virtually. Unfortunately, uh, he couldn't make it uh, due to unforeseen circumstances. Um, Ntate, the last one. Professor Oliladi. Welcome, Prof. Atangana. Colleagues, uh, as I indicated, we already interviewed 60 of our researchers, 33. They are already uploaded on our YouTube channel, the library YouTube channel. After recording, we do the editing, and uh, before we upload, we do what we call the, uh, to look at the, the impact of their research they are doing, so that when we profile them uh, on, our, on our researcher profile, it's there, it's the, it's the video, the interview video, then it's, it's, the, it's the impact of the research that they are currently doing. And we can only showcase uh, on the main page just the first 20 of their publications. Um, so you can visit that. The others are currently under review and we will be sharing with you. Um, colleagues, uh, we have given our, our panelists seven, uh, seven to 10 minutes just to give us, um, uh, to share with us their research journey. And from there, we would take a few questions from the floor. Thank you. We will start with you, Prof. Maybe let's go from my left to my right. Over to you. Am 
mind making use of this? No, you can sit oh. okay. I think I'll be the first person today. <laughs> um, I think my research journey started since when I was a first graduate student. Um, I was um, doing my research in uh, PhD in environmental management, and I tried to look at the impact of mining, you know, um, on the environment and the sustainability of, of mining. And then during my research, I found out that um, communities, you know, are usually impacted by mining, especially because of their livelihoods, you know, um, soil pollution, water pollution, and um, also um, the sources of energy that they use as well. So through that, I just I got to know that there's an interconnection and it involves interdisciplinary kind of research, and also it also involves you um, thinking about how can you do remediation. So um, from that, you know, I worked on the water energy food nexus and also the impact of landfills because nowadays there's a lot of waste that we are generating and um, the landfills are getting filled and there's no land anymore to, you know, to, to make for suitable landfill sites. So eventually, um, you find that landfill also affects the air quality, it affects our water quality, it affects our soil quality as well, which eventually affects our human health and the ecosystems as well. So those are what my research has, are based on. And, um, uh, since then, my postgraduate student and I have been working on how we can do remediation of polluted lands, uh, polluted soils and water using cost-effective methods, and also how we can also uh, contribute to policies through the uh, the result that we get from our research, so that government can start, you know, enacting policies that can be implemented by municipalities and even the government at large to enable an environment you know, that will be sustainable for future generations. And not just that as well, people are talking about the issue of climate change. We find out that human, you know, the progenic activities of humans contribute a lot to what we call climate change today. So one of the things that we also do, you know, my student and I do, is to see how we can use natural processes to mitigate you know, the impact of climate change and also how we can adapt you know, to uh, the ongoing global warming and uh, climate change. So basically, um, right now I have uh, seven PhD students you know, working on different research and 10 master students. And um, I've graduated 24 master students and four PhD students on all these various uh, projects that I'm talking about. And we're still ongoing. And some of the research that I'm doing right now is we've applied for funding for WRC that we're trying to see how we can use um, the natural, uh, some of the natural indigenous plants growing here in South Africa to remediate uh, what we call nitrogen and, and phosphate um, uh, pollution from agricultural runoffs. So that is one of the research that we're doing. We're also looking at circular economy, especially seeing how we can use waste from, uh, from ESCOM, you know, after you produce energy, there's some waste that is generated. How can we use it in other industries? So those are some of the projects that we are working on. Thank you. Um, my, uh, my fellow um, researchers, you are more than welcome to speak while you are sitting down, whatever makes you comfortable. Thank you. I think uh, I will sit. Okay. <laughs> Uh, for me, it started when I was in high school. Uh, I noticed that all mathematical formula and theorem they were named after people from the, the global north. Mm -hmm. And asked myself the following question, does that mean our grandparents did nothing in mathematics? <laughs> and uh, for me, it was not only to go to school, or get a degree, or do research. I told myself I'm going to make impact so that before I die, people from the north we we'll also use theorems that are named after a guy from Africa. So uh, when I finished my uh, degree in Cameroon, I moved to South Africa. Uh, I was doing applied mathematics. And we noticed that when we go to the field, we collect some data. Uh, uh, we want to model the, 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 the specific real field uh, problem that we observe. We use the, the, the Newton derivative. And we notice that there is a deviation between experimental data and our model. 
So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is the problem? Does that mean my data are uncertain or my mathematical model is not valid? So we notice that the mathematical model has some limitation because in general what is happening is that uh, God gave us the power to control our environment. And to control our environment, we first of all observe it. After the observation, we analyze uh, the data that we collect, then we do the model. After we do the model, if there is a connection between or agreement between the mathematical model and the data that we collected, then we can go and do the prediction. Or for example, if I give you an example, when we had pro, uh, COVID problem in, in, in the world, what is the problem? We need to know what will happen in the next uh, three days, four days, one more. So we need a mathematical model that is actually accurate to tell us that in 20 days, we are going to have three people that will die. So uh, uh, with uh, the Newton derivative, we have this uh, problem that there is no whole way an agreement between our model and the mathematical uh, and the data. So in 2016, uh, I created a new operator uh, that is a derivative and another one, you know, when you have a derivative, you must create an integral for you to form what they call calculus. So that derivative was named after me, even the integral. So it's been used to model process, as uh, Prof was speaking, you know, modeling uh, the spray of disease, you can model the, the, the movement of uh, water, you can mo uh, model the, the decay of a human, you can actually model almost everything that you think, you think of. And uh, that is uh, what uh, uh, I contributed in mathematics. Besides that, uh, 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 it is good to recognize that nature is created by God and that mathematics is created by human beings. So mathematicians sometimes they are very arrogant when they introduce an operator, they think that that operator can solve all the problems. It is wrong because nature is very complex. So later on, I introduced another operator, they call it fractal fractional, because I noticed that uh, the one that I introduced can solve some problem but there are other problems that we cannot solve. So I cannot break it down now. So uh, I, I did several of such type of operator, and uh, uh, around it, uh, it made me to become editor in many journals. It made me to get some awards, like the UNESCO award that I got uh, last time. And uh, I graduated already 11 PhD since 2015. And uh, I don't know many, many masters, I don't remember the number. <laughs> and uh, I wrote also uh, 11 books and uh, many papers. So that is what I'm doing. Thank you. I prefer to stand. <laughs> right. Uh, in my profile as the researcher, it all started when I was doing my diploma in translation at the university of South Africa after obtaining my PhD at the University of Stellenbosch. You know, at the time when I was doing a translation, that is the area where I started to learn so many things, particularly with regard to the relationship between translation and, and, and research in this way, that there's a saying that translation is the house in which we live. Why so? Because it cuts across each and every field of study. Legal, politics, science, sports, whatever. They are included, you know, in translation. You get to know and study more about those uh, areas. That is why I then developed a great love in translation, now looking at it from a research point of view, researching more about all these various field, fields. And again, to respond to the question why, as a linguist, why our language, our languages, African languages, seems to be dependent on English, particularly, let me just isolate English. Translation, translating from English to Sesotho, you find that as a translator, you are bound to go word for word from, from English. That is one thing that I wanted to research further, that can we ever reach a stage 
where these languages are equivalent because there have been a theory of equivalence, the equivalence principle. Now, I wanted to refute the claim that these languages can be equivalent because they are different. There is no way that they can be, they, they can be uh, identical. Particularly when you, you put in, you factor in the cultural aspect into picture. That is why when I was still around here, I wrote, uh, uh, I conducted a research entitled The Birth of a New Paradigm, where I was looking at uh, Sesotho translation as a cultural phenomenon. You know, trying to show that Sesotho language is dependent. Even though you would translate from English, you must remember that it is a language in its own right. So it can communicate the same meaning in terms of the African Afrocentric uh, way, not dependent on English. Then I also discovered through research, of course, within translation itself, that uh, 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 Sesotho, Sesotho, what you refer to as, as a Sesotho target text, meaning a text that is derived from uh, the English, is the second origin. What you had in English as the original text that you translated from is as much independent and uh, original as English itself. That is why I wrote, I conducted the research again, where I wanted to challenge the idea that Sesotho is dependent on, on English, and then had Sesotho target text as the second origin. Then again, I challenged the claim that when you translate from English to Sesotho, you can again back translate from Sesotho to English. Then I discovered again that no, it cannot work that way. Translation is a one-way traffic. Simply because culture is involved. Remember, if you move it from English to Sesotho, now you factor in the Sesotho African spices eh, into it. So you can't take it back to English. It will never be original again. It's without spices. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it lost those spices. But be that as may, let me let me end up there and talk about what motivated me to know that what I'm doing is in fact right in terms of the research. Many students have problems as far as research is concerned simply because they think that when you write a research, you just put in facts. You just write and then what do you think you put on paper, of which research is not like that. You have to follow what is referred to as SOC. SOC, S-O-C-K. And S stands for significant, O stands for original, C stands for contribution, and K stands for knowledge. In other words, when you write a research, you must provide a significant, original, contribution to the body of knowledge. If it is not like that, you haven't done anything. But then somebody challenged me the other day to say that, no, but how can you put in S O there, the significant aspect? Because as we say, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. In other words, what is significant to you may not be necessarily be significant to me. Then I said, no, within the confines of research, remember that research is conducted by its paradigms, yeah? the research design, and what you call the golden thread. You have research questions, you have research objectives, okay, and you have the research aid. If you follow those, in terms of what you're going to write about, 
then you know that at the end, this is going to be a significant contribution that you would have made to your public readers. And finally, there is again the acronym that I want to give you, the FREEN. That trans uh, uh, research can never end. Yes. When you wake up in the morning, it starts. When you, when you sleep, it ends. In other words, we live in research. FREEN stands for F, FEDA, R, research, I, is and needed. Further research is needed. In other words, when you research, you must always think that it is necessary for you to research further. Yes. It's not the end. What you have uh, discovered there, never draw a line to say that this is generalized and it features to everybody. Further research is needed. So I end up saying that. Thank you very much. Okay, that's going to be tough uh, following. <laughs> so I'm going to prefer sitting down then. <laughs> okay, so I'm a, um, I'm a soil scientist. And I, um, my research started probably when I was a baby eating some soil. And that's where it started. And I, um, as I went through my schooling, I... I was really interested in how things work and how does I, I uh, looked at scenery around me and I looked at rocks and mountains and the different colors of soils and it really interested me how does that work, why do you get a certain soil that's brown and yellow and uh, the slopes of mountains. So that's I think where things started and as I um, studied um, I got involved in research and I, I realized that's what I want to do. I want to further things and I want to more understand how things work. I want to, um, it, it, it starts in the morning and it ends in the evening. So you have to uh, constantly work on it and understanding a system. But not just understanding it, and understanding how to, to help farmers and help, how to help a community. So I'm very much into trying to understand how things work so that you can better a system. So we, we have terms like uh, regeneration or conservation agriculture, for example, and this uh, regeneration means uh, not just bettering the system, but you have to or keep it, uh, conservation means you, you conserve, you keep it the same. So regenerated means you have to better the system. So to do that, you need to research because you need to understand the basics of how soil works and how can you um, convince farmers how to how to improve it, right? So I also believe that soil has these two words for soil, especially in English. If you look after soil, it's soil. If you don't look after, it becomes dirt. So you need the dirt to stay soil. And to do that, we research. So we check and make sure how can we improve the soil and that it fits whatever someone's doing. It. So it's not just farmer um, farmer communities. We're also looking at environmental issues like uh, pollution. So if if you've got a certain soil, why is it being polluted? What, what is people doing wrong in it? So you need to understand the, the, the basic, the science of the soil and understand how it works. So this for me is, I'm very passionate about it and I have quite a few students working on it. Um, we especially work on soil quality, soil health, soil carbon, emissions, global warming, things like that. See how we can look at that small skin around the earth that you have to protect and uh, make sure that you can keep it for future generations and we don't uh, go down the drain. So yeah, so we, um, I, I work on that. We also work, I strongly believe in uh, interdisciplinary. Um, uh, we work with not just interdisciplinary, but you also have multidisciplinary. So you have to bring the social side, understand why is a farmer doing it? What's the history behind it? What's the culture behind it? And then try to, yeah, it's all science. It's all, all science based. So yeah, I'm very <laughs> passionate. We've got, Quite a few students working on uh, carbon specifically, carbon emissions out of soil, how the organisms in soil, you know that if you have a handful of soil, there's more organisms in a handful of soil than people on earth. Yeah. Yes, so if you start counting them, like those organisms, and you count them one, two, three, you'll probably be busy for three months. Okay. So there's so many organisms in soil, and they are your laborers. And so for me, uh, I want to understand what are they doing and how can we use these laborers? They work for free, 
We just need to give them some food and make sure they are sheltered, then they work for us. And so, um, yeah, that's what we work on, trying to see how to, to look in depth into the soil and get, get, it, get the system working. That's what I do. Thank you. I want to change the status quo. <laughs> <laughs> mm, my experience with research, actually, I only learned that I'm a linguist, a language expert, and also a literacy development expert. It's interdisciplinary. Um, I did my research in literacy development. That's why I noticed that I, I could have the answer to the crisis that we are currently experiencing regarding poor performance in literacy. The PELS results are actually speaking to that. So with this research passion, uh, last week we had a, an invitation from Motero district. Um, they wanted us to attend the INDABA, where they were going to address the issues of poor literacy performance. So I noticed that here is the time now for me to, to, to hone that, that problem solving scale. So I volunteered to, to take the action of helping the children or learners of Motel District, where I am going to conduct a research of establishing the problem that is lying in the classroom for these learners to be unable to, to read. And, and this is not going to end here at Motel District. I'm targeting the districts across Bloemfontein and across the, 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 the national space. So hence my research as a language expert, a linguist, and also a literacy development expert. It's only targeting the areas of solving the crisis of literacy development in here in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I don't have to disturb the pattern. It seems if one stands up, the one sits down. So I will, I will sit down and thank you colleagues for, for the opportunity. And um, I really appreciate, uh, my name is Victor Madube. I'm in the Faculty of Education, um, Curriculum and Studies in particular. So my research area is in education, religion, and politics. So I try to combine these three aspects because they speak to one another. And without problematizing, problematizing each, we will not get a, a democratic society that we all yearn of. So I, I research on particularly the Zimbabwean context and my um, center of argument that a better Zimbabwe is a better, it's, it's better for the SADC and better for Africa. And because of that, it requires a certain courage, a certain scholarship, which is framed in decoloniality to question the often taken for granted assumptions which usually is, are held by politicians. And part of it is to say, if we scholars keep quiet at such a time as this, then no one can speak uh, on behalf of the marginalized, the disfranchised people in society. Therefore, that research is the research that tries to question and bring into perspectives that um, religious leaders, institutes, and organization must come on part to be part and parcel of the, the democratic uh, society. And um, because of that, we know, of course, we have, um, uh, because we deal with um, religion and politics, we have also got a very um, a backlash from different people because whenever religion is used, the people tend not to question, people tend to be, to be actually lawyer. To, to religion and therefore our approach is to say religion is good but it is um, it, it can easily be abused and because it can easily be abused the politicians rise right on it to ensure that uh, we are always suppressed and therefore how can educational narratives break that and 
try to, to ensure that uh, a democratic society emerges. So my student and my postdoctoral fellow uh, research around the synergies of those three aspects in the post-colonial Africa, especially framed from decolonial theories with the intention of trying to produce a democratic society, a, a society where even religious leaders, uh, politicians um, are, are accountable for what they do in society as a way to better uh, produce a, a society that all we live in it. So in the past um, um, uh, three, four years, um, we, we have just written more than 100 articles and four books um, trying to make arguments that a better Africa is good for us all. So that even if we go to the West and they ask us, what are we doing about the African situation, about the violence, about the xenophobia, and all the aspects that are, are problematic in Africa, we can boldly say we are actually busy writing, problematizing with the intention of uh, igniting a better society for, for us all. So that's the incense of my research, and thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, my learned colleagues. Um, colleagues, um, I, I think another round of applause. Yes. This exceeded my, this ex exceeded our expectation because this is exactly what we wanted to, to tell the world. This is what you wanted to tell the world. But because we, we, we crafted questions, uh, at, at some stage, w when I was going through the videos, I could sense that um, uh, although it was getting there, the time was not enough. But as you would know, a YouTube video should not be too long because then people would look, miss out. But today, now we know why our researchers, what are they doing and why are they doing it? Another round of applause. <laughs> I'm going to open up the uh, floor for questions. Um, maybe I can start with Professor Atangan. Prof, um, you, uh, is there a possibility that you can give us a prediction um, on the lot of numbers? <laughs> We'll take a round of three and then allow the... Uh, good. Is it option? So many. Uh, good. Good morning uh, to my elders. I believe I'm the only first year in this room. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I would like to thank the host for this event and our beloved panelists. Uh, initially, I was not someone who was intending to pursue a PhD, but listening to what you have to say and the level of impact that you are making um, actually inspired to actually pursue my studies. So, so uh, my question is directed to Professor Abdon. Uh, if you were to be a minister of basic education, what would you do differently with regards to how mathematics is being taught in schools because uh, from the way I saw things, uh, moving from high school coming to varsity, I believe uh, the injustice that was done to us in metric was that we were taught the question paper, we were not taught mathematics. So now we end up finding uh, modules like calculus now being more challenging because we find ourselves not using calculators, we find ourselves not having formula sheets. So my question is that what you should do differently in a way that students would be inspired to actually bring that mathematics into reality because you brought your mathematics into reality, developing all those models that are there to save the daily life issues. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for being honest. Uh, of course, I will never be a minister, 
<laughs> if I become a minister, it's going to be, a, a, I'm a straight guy, straight, straight. <laughs> so, uh, you know, even when I was in high school in Cameroon, uh, I noticed that they show us only formula. And sometimes they show us, the person that is showing us this formula does not know himself where those formula can be used. And it becomes very difficult for us to follow those formula because you ask yourself this big formula, what is this used for? When they teach you where that formula will be used, and how that formula can save your grandmother, your farm, how that formula can uh, be used to predict what will happen to your village tomorrow, not accurately, but asymptotically to know an idea of what could happen tomorrow, then you will develop a passion to understand that formula knowing that you are going to use it. And that is a big problem that we have mm. in Africa. You know, they teach us only the theory, and because it's that what European people show us but when you go to other countries, developed countries, where they show you a specific formula, the first thing is, this formula can be applied here. For example, if I explain to a student the derivative, what is the derivative? I show him the, the, the formula of the derivative, and I tell him that because of this idea of derivative, we can have a car having a certain speed. You can, for example, see a car come in front of you and say, if I don't go with this, this speed, this car is going to hit me. You show the student where that thing can be applied. And that's what we lack in Africa. And uh, uh, especially in, in South Africa, I was in uh, NRF when I raised the idea of uh, math literacy. Let me tell you something, mathematics is the center of everything. Why do I say the center of everything? If you want to be a good chemist, you must know certain basic in mathematics. And it, it should be a, a, a topic that we pay attention, we teach our people, uh, you know, for them to become better scientists because if somebody is doing a research, maybe even in lang language, there is some an, uh, statistical analysis that you may need. So, if I become a minister, first thing, math literacy, I will remove it. <laughs> Secondly, I will remove the idea that you have to, you must have thirty five percent for you because you don't use it at the university. We need somebody who understand, who understand mathematics, who has some basic in mathematics for you to go and do chemistry, for you to go and do. Other, other thing. And let me also tell you something that I, I noticed here in, in African country. We, we place value to things that cannot develop our continent. Mm. You, can, you cannot every time put in a guy that is just running. We can all run. I understand that some guy run more than the other one. Yeah. But you, you, when you run, you become the hero of the continent. But can you really change the continent by running or by sinking? <laughs> or by playing football. So I think that it is time for African government to place value to sales, technology, uh, 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 engineering, and mathematics. So if I become a minister, uh, maybe president, uh, <laughs> things uh, will, be, will, be, will, will be different. So please do your PhD. We need many PhD uh, from Africa. Thank yeah. you. very much. Uh, I appreciate I've been watching the YouTube uh, videos on our library page and I had a few questions but I'll just sum it up into two questions. The first one is a comment to say the library is actually um, exposing us that we don't have excuses anymore. We have, we know that it's possible because we have the people that do it and we know that it's possible because we have the support as the presentations before. My question is, how do we, as young researchers, not get consumed or overwhelmed by the support that we have and think that we can save the world so quickly because we think that because the data can be processed in a second rather than a month, that I can do this thing so quickly. How do we preserve the quality of the research that we do? Thank you. you the question is to <laughs> anyone, uh, but let's take another one. Uh, I think Lee was next. Oh, yeah. Cornell. Um, thank you. So um, I hope um, I'm going to put my question right. Um, it's mostly to um, Dr. Motlani and um, Prof. Dube. Um, in terms of, uh, we're working so much in the support services. 
um, with with artificial intelligence and, and trying to catch up with how we can support academics and researchers and how to advise. Um, so in terms of, of the translation research, um, you know, if you're doing any projects um, already um, with artificial intelligence and um, then linking to um, decolonizing how how does I mean artificial intelligence can be very biased because it uses what exists. Um, so yeah, my interest is in any projects that you're doing in relation to that. But also, um, Prof. Dubit, how can support services um, help in in your decolonization efforts? Because we, I'm just thinking in the library. So we get these tools, we make them available, but are they contributing or not? Thanks. Can I respond to it? Yeah. Right. The, the starting point, as far as research is concerned, regarding the problem that you are citing, is that, as I said, it's more reliant on English more than it is supposed to be within the African Sesotho I uh, just say it's a sort of a situation. So in order to avoid that problem, that is why I said that culture or cultural factors should be factored in. In other words, you've got to translate within the culture of the target group that you're translating for. In that case, then, there won't be any problem. There will always be a problem if you translate within a specific, that is why um, there is this uh, Lawrence Venuti, who is talking about uh, domestication and foreignization. If you translate, but your translation being orientated to the English, then it is foreignized. In other words, it is not actually relevant to the cultural situation of the people you are translating for. In other words, then you have to domesticate it. Make it, it must, it must move away from how it had been before. The, 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 the people you are translating for should understand that this, this is meant for me, in my own way, my situation. It accommodates me nicely and effectively so. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Cornell, and a very uh, good question. And um, uh, let me just also say, um, either academic or support people, we should be doing something in academia. And um, it will be said that people want, don't want to publish because they are hiding behind support, uh, being support services and so on. I think that era is ending at UFS. We all need, all of you behind the camera, behind whatever you're doing, a desk, we should contribute to knowledge. Then we can achieve impact and so on. But the starting point um, of, of, of decoloniality and so on um, is that we cannot uh, put a formula in how it is done because we, we would end up in the trap of um, colonizing people again. But what then is important and what we always emphasize is let people understand what is called the politics of knowledge. Who generates knowledge? And that's what uh, Prof. Tangana was saying. Uh, who generates knowledge? Why do we have to always have um, ideas from the West defining or what we are saying? As long as people are able to question what we do and desire to say we want that knowledge to come from ourselves as opposed to, to coming from the West. And, and particularly, and what is interesting even within us education, I don't know if I, I will be uh, unpopular because of that, but it's fine if to become unpopular because we need to disturb the status quo. I always ask, you know, why up to today, many years, do we still teach people like Piaget in our curricula? Do we still teach people like Van Gogh in our curricula? Yes, they have a contribution, but if 50 years still teach doing teacher education and we are still teaching everyone about Piaget, 
then it means we are not growing. And part of it requires and invites all of us as African scholars to write, you know. Let's not run away from writing. We need to put our ideas down so that they can influence the curriculum. Because the other challenge is that if we replace what we have, what we put, we have nothing, and because our, our colleagues are not writing. So understanding the politics of knowledge that we cannot make Europe as the benchmark of what we do here in Africa. And, and similarly, and to, to, to end, especially with us that do supervision, you know, it's strange that we, we, we want our students to collect data in Buchabelo and Kwakwa. And after that, we want them to understand that data using the theoretical lenses of Europe, where those people have never been into Africa and do not even understand how people in Buchabelo stay. Why don't we get our own theories that we can frame up here? Why will a political student at university do a, 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 a theorization of um, a fake law in terms of uh, um, uh, um, understanding politics when we have got many political ideas that are coming from here, such as Julius Malem. I'm not, I'm say, I'm not pro, <laughs> saying I'm promoting him, but we actually have ideas that we can conceptualize and write down and become theories on how to, to, to decolonize, how to make things. So it starts with us. And we also, and I'm glad I do go to Europe, and I tell them, Europe, you are not the standard for us. We can contribute, and we, I know, and scholars that are here, I'm glad we know we stand toe to toe with Europe. And when we, are, we get there, we only also show them that, you know, we are doing something in Africa. And we invite you also in the support service to say this battle cannot be won by two or three professors at UFS, but all of us, let's stand up and be counted in knowledge production. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you. Uh, Prof. Elmari, um, uh, you speak of soy, and um, have you considered looking at, um, I'm not sure within the university if there are academics looking at indigenous knowledge systems, because um, there the, the is, uh, the, probably there are there are quite a number of uh, people with that interest in terms of indigenous knowledge and the meaning of soil in the country. Um, yes, uh, in South Africa, soil science, there's a soil science society for South Africa, and we have a whole system classification of soil for South Africa. We also have one for Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yes, uh, uh, we, we can also not use examples of Europe or America. We are not in the same climate system. The closest is maybe South America or Australia that we can compare. So we have to build our own uh, system, and we do have that. We have a very strong system on, even, even not just South Africa, we have different provinces. So you cannot compare Western Cape with, with the Free State. We have different soils. So we have a very good knowledge base uh, developed in South Africa, and um, the universities are working together as well, making databases for the different soils. We're working with different companies as well, uh, fertilizer companies, for example, across the country, where we have databases for uh, soil-specific uh, for a certain region. So I think we are definitely decolonized uh, in, in uh, the soil science division. We do, of course, work with uh, European colleagues, but they are very interested in, in uh, Working in Africa, I'm not sure what their motives are. Sometimes it's political, I'm not sure, but they bring some money in, and then we say, yes, bring. Uh, we can use it. So we've, 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 they are interested in seeing how it works. So I, I think we are, we've got a good basis. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, can I, um, just to be more controversial now, can I read their NRF ratings? A Y rating means a promising young researcher, right? Um, and then an A, it's, it says it's a leading international researcher. So maybe this question is to Prof. Atangana. Why, why would you be classified a young 
a promising young researcher when when you 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 have been recognized as the one percent in consecutive years since 2020 uh, in in science and in mathematics um, and just recently by Stanford University so how, how, how do you how do you reconcile the only thing that that could be true is the young part <laughs> but promising and being one percent it doesn't is there as a library actually I, I, let me just make that commitment as a library we want because now I understand it's open we want to see you as an A rated researcher because that's how the world sees you it's only South Africa that doesn't see you as a, a leading international research based on the awards we are receiving. Okay, I, I want to make a comment. Uh, fractional calculus where I'm expert, we, we talk about non-locality. I'm a non-local researcher. I applied for NRF 2014, what I was, I was the first postdoc to apply for NRF. So when I got the report, they said they praised me much and they give me why they take. So I applied again for, uh, I think two years ago or this year or some, something like that. And the report came back saying that the five or six uh, uh, people that they contact, they praised me much. They gave me, uh, they, they are saying that I'm more than what I am. And they said I'm editor in many journals. And the fact that I'm editor in many journals and I have some paper in those journals, they are not too sure. <laughs> and they also said uh, I have many citations. And they sent back my application and they told me to justify. But let me tell you something. I told the vice director of research I cannot be rated by South Africa. Mm. Because I'm the second mathematician in South Africa to be fellow of World Academy of Science. And I was, I'm the first person in the world to be World Academy of Science under the age of 40. I am the first African mathematician to be highly cited consecutively. I cannot cite all the accolades. Uh, this year I was promoted as a... Uh, the editorial board, the editorial board of uh, twice. That means if you want to become fellow, I have to judge you. And we are five in the world. I'm the representing Africa. And you're, and you're promising. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, what, what can I say? So uh, what I noticed, let me tell you something. In 2014, uh, uh, 20, I was nominated for fellow of African Academy of Science. But I'm already fellow, but affiliated because I'm under 40. So when my report came back, they say I'm very young. So I cannot be fellow. The same year, some people in the United States nominated me for uh, uh, fellow of World Academy of Science. They gave me immediately. So in my opinion, there is a problem within our society yeah. where we don't want to recognize the effort and the impact of somebody. Uh, I got the, the, the award of UNESCO. Mm. The UNESCO award for you to be nominated it should be either the president of the country that nominate you or a chair of UNESCO. And I was nominated. They got 2,500 uh, nomination around the world. And they shortlisted two, uh, 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 200. And this was made by the film medal. It was made by people that have a, a, um, a Nobel Prize. There is a Nobel Prize. So five people, independent people, they assess our application. I was number one in the world. And I got it representing Africa. Do you know what happened? I was alone. I was alone when China brought 40 people because their daughter got that award. I was alone. 
when Bre uh, Argentina brought the dear minister. I was abandoned when the Arab state brought a lot of people. I was the only person that went in UNESCO, France, to collect that award alone. And when I came back, it was even difficult for even my university to recognize my effort, to tell me congratulations. My ambassador said no, they were, they were busy. I was alone in France, and I came back in Africa. My speech, when I spoke there, I told them I will never leave Africa. I will stay here to make sure the next generation knows that we contribute, as our brother said. Yeah. And I was alone there. Do you know how I felt? Yeah. Sure. I asked myself, maybe because I'm a foreigner in South Africa, or maybe I'm black, I felt very bad. So I took a decision, I will never apply for NRF, because they cannot read me. I read people. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, so uh, really, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very angry because of this. I even arrived at the airport here. Uh, they were asking me what is in your bag because they gave me the medal is gold. <laughs> so the, the, the lady was asking me, Chief, what is here? You know what I mean of a, a, a guy like me, when you arrive at the airport, they ask you, Chief, what is inside? <laughs> you, you, maybe you don't know. So, so there is a problem in our system that we have to solve. And I, what I think is that the University of Free State, if you want to reach Vision 2030, we should shy away with those small things like, oh, he's a, a fellow of uh, South African something. We should represent ourselves internationally. Yeah. So for me, NRF is zero and Francais. Mm -hmm. Zero. I will never apply for it. And I told the vice rector, I will never apply for such thing. But I will bring glory in Africa every time. Thank you. Yeah. While he's taking it, uh, Prof, uh, uh, Dr. Co um, uh, on the issue of the environment, um, we, we are seeing quite a lot of, of discussion. Um, in, in, I mean, I, I, also, I also see in governance now, as part of the governance uh, uh, mandate is to, when they look at investing, they, there's now that emphasis on social uh, things, uh, um, uh, look at uh, the, the, the things that you invest on, things that supports the, the environment. What do you think could be the contribution uh, in terms of this? Maybe uh, we will couple that with the, with the questions from the mm, well, th Thank you. Thank you so much to the panel, and it's very insightful. I am really saddened by what Prof. Tagane uh, said. It's, uh, it's really sad that we have this in 2023. Mm. Um, I, I think those who are scholars of information science know that there is a, a module called the political economy of information. So I think we have a problem in terms of what they refer to as the global system of governance. So in a couple of days' time or weeks' time, we are having in South Africa the BRIC summit, the block, the multilateral block. Um, so what I want to find out from our panelists is that what is the prediction? Because I think we, we are struggling with this so-called rule-based order. And some of these rules are being made in the global north, as we all know. So I want to ask uh, perhaps uh, Prof. Dube, because you said something that uh, perhaps can shed light on this one as well. Um, what, what, what is your prediction on what's going to happen perhaps in the next five years in terms of the global system of governance? Okay. Um, okay. Should we? Should we start? Okay. okay. I'll answer the first question on the issue of the environment. I just want to say, um, how many of us can go without drinking water for a day? Okay? 
How many of you can go without eating? At least you can fast for one day or two days. How many of you can go without eating for like three days? Huh? How many of you? <laughs> okay, someone is raising their hands. I think maybe you can fast for seven days. How many of you can go without breathing good quality here in, a, in three seconds? Okay. Now, most of the sicknesses and diseases, and uh, if you, especially in terms of even the sustainable development goals, are related to issues of the environment. If you want to have a healthy ecosystem, live a healthy life, and all those kind of things, you need an healthy environment. And often at times, we as humans, we are not proactive until something happens. The issue of drought in South Africa and the issue of um, lack of water, water scarcity. Someone said there's going to be a world war, you know, in the future very soon, it's going to be because of water. And I think the government is now starting to realize this, that we need to take the issues of the environment very serious and that most of the resources that we use come from the environment. Every time you go to the grocery store, you go to pick and pay, you buy things, you don't know where it comes from. All you think about, you open your tap, water comes out of it. The moment you open your tap one day and no water comes out, for two days, then you will understand why we need to take this issue very serious. And what we're doing, especially in the issue of those of us studying environmental major or environmental science, is that all of these things are connected. Many people are crying because of the issue of climate change. I tell my students that the climate has not changed yet. Because if the climate has really changed, none of us will survive. What is happening is we are seeing climate variability. So, and it's a sign that the climate could change, but now we could do something about it. So many of us will not survive even when the climate does change. And I always say, if you take care of Mother Earth, the Earth is our mother. If we take good care of it, the Earth will take good care of us. And I think the government now realizing that we, they need to start investing in the issue of the environment, and that is why they're taking it very serious. These days, if you want to apply for a grant, if you put the issue of climate change in it, you know, you get funding, because they know that this is a crisis. And one thing I always say is that, look, if the air is being polluted in South Africa, you know, it affects Lesotho, it affects Mozambique, it affects all the nations around us. So it doesn't just stay within South Africa. So we cannot stay, say anymore, ah, ESCOM is polluting the air, yeah, it doesn't matter, because the air is a common good. It's for everybody all over the world. And that is why, you know, um, you know the government needs to start, you know, um, pumping money and doing research that involves technology innovations, you know, um, and also involve people as well, the social aspect. Because who are the people, you know, polluting the environment? Who are polluting the environment? It is we. And that is why our research also involves us, you know, educating people, bringing awareness to people that, look, we need to change the way we do things. Business as usual cannot go on anymore. You know, the pattern, the way we consume resources, the way we use resources has to change. Even those people in the rural areas who are not literate, we need to bring, you know, the information to them in a way that they could understand in a non-literate way. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your question. And um, maybe picking up on what Prof. Atagana said, and I'm glad we are doing it uh, live. We, we, we are saying it. We don't want to say it in corridors. Yeah, we are saying it, everyone listening, even in the university. And, um, and um, one also thing that also made me live in RIF, I got a rejection with one paragraph that said you are overproductive. <laughs> and therefore, <laughs> And therefore, so we are asking, is, it, is there a deliberate attempt to block certain people, certain mm. nationalities, mm. certain race in this thing? So because we are busy with the important agendas, we will pack this for, 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 for later when, but we will continue telling them that we are suspicious that it's designed to frustrate us. Have some of us that might not belong to certain categories that they prefer. But now, interesting, let also me also say, uh, uh, looking at the question that I've been given, is that, you see, 
if, if people are not able to speak, then we'll not change Africa. It's all about mindset. I want to give you even an example here. We, we bring people in meetings, and in any meeting at UFS, you know that so-and-so is going to speak, and no one else will speak. Some people are going to meetings to say, not yet, not yet, chat, not yet, not yet. And by that, we are destroying the culture of accountability, leadership, and bringing good ideas into the fore. So such platform is this way people can be able to say things. We will build a culture where we are going to question our leaders, we are going to question our system. And the moment we begin and have courage to question our system, we are in the right direction towards transformation and change. So I also want to encourage you, when you are sent to meetings, we are not interested in your noted. We want you to contribute and speak so that that can have a ripple effect in future to transform our society. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, before we wrap, maybe I just let me throw last pen. Um, we are seeing a rise in manager, managerialism in higher education, where academics take the back burner and managers now make decisions for an academic institution. I'll, I'll, I'll make an example. For instance, we look at uh, allocation of what we normally call SLE job um, availability of posts. It's made by managers, not by academics. We look at um, ICT infrastructure. I mean, if you can look at the budget of the ICT infrastructure, how much of it is more academic and how much it's more for just for the benefit of the managers? You would even be, you would even think that you are a bank with the security that goes through in there. So if you think about the investment that goes in, to what is your what is your when you look at currently, do you think uh, are we moving in the right direction in terms of uh, have, uh, having more emphasis on the academy? I, 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 I would also show, for instance, if you look at staffing, do you think that we? It, it's, 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 there is a balance between non uh, uh, support staff uh, who are what we call them core. For instance, a, a university cannot exist without a library. You ne will never get accreditation. You can never exist, for instance, without a center for graduate support. You cannot offer PhDs if you don't have that. Uh, you will never get accreditation. But you can outsource HR. And you can outsource, even if you don't have HR or you don't have ICT, you can still be a university because you can outsource it. But you cannot outsource the land. But when you look at this, the, so my question really is around the managerialism. That do, you, do you see it as a rise at, at institution generally? Not necessarily here, but also what, what in terms of the research, which research, how can we improve, other than speaking out? What else can we really do to make sure that the, the, the university becomes African universities, uh, not universities in Africa? Because currently, the research is up, it's, although we are in Africa, but it's just a research. Uh, we are not really African universities, but we are just universities in Africa. Uh, it's just an open question. You don't have to uh, commit yourself if you don't have to, but um, just the rise of managerialism. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, let me first of all, um, I'll just answer the way I think. I think in university we shouldn't pop, probably uh, politicalize anything in the university because this is where the fountain of knowledge mm. and where we train people mm. that are supposed to develop the country comes from. And um, especially when you talk about uh, positions, you know, uh, because I know that it happens in municipalities and in government departments. It is about political appointment and who you know. Mm. Universities should not be like that. It's about who knows and who can contribute knowledge. Mm. And if we want our African university to be able to compete internationally, we need to start doing research, you know, that can compete internationally. I remember there was one time I used myself as an example. I submitted a paper for a journal. And then one of the reviews, because you have to review the paper, one of the reviews I could see was really by Hastros, maybe because the research came 
from Africa. And he immediately said, what software did they use? How did they collect the data? So there was no concrete, um, how will I say, criticism that could help me, you know, to improve the paper, you know. But some other reviewers, two other reviewers were kind of really positive, I mean, positive in their criticism. But I could see that this particular person felt that no good research could come out of Africa. And what, and that was a challenge for me. And I said, no, I'm going to make sure that this get paper gets accepted. So I really worked on it with my postgraduate students, you know. And the paper has been published and it's been cited more than 60 times now. Mm -hmm. So well, what am I saying is that if we are going to stand up in Africa, if we are going, they're going to take notice of us, like what um, Professor uh, uh, Tukana is saying, the reason why they could notice him is because, look, he's doing research that is not just only um, relevant locally to South Africa and Africa, but also relevant to the international realm as well. You know, I get invited to many uh, um, international uh, speaking organizations to come and talk because my research is not just based on Africa alone. They could see that, yes, I'm doing my research using the African context, but now they can also apply it to the international context. So no more do we have to only look for research from the international context to apply to Africa, but now they can now start using research from Africa to apply to the international context. That is where we're going. And for us to be able to do that, we need to start employing people, not based on political worms, but also people that have the knowledge and the integrity to take Africa forward. Thank you. Um, I want to add to what uh, my colleague has just indicated. Uh, I think we are also part of the blame because it's like we are benchmarking us against the, 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 the Western ways of doing things. For instance, when as a manager, I encourage my staff to publish only to journals that are curated. And... So we are encouraging our, our staff to publish on journals that are curated. And on the other hand, we are looking at we need to be rated internationally. What is it? People are doing business. That is all about money. We need to sit down and question ourselves. If we want to promote our brand, we cannot benchmark it against the Western way of doing things. Thank you. Sure. I, I, I wish we had time. Um, I wish we had time. Um, but um, we, we are privileged. We are privileged. Prof, you have a last word, and then I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, because I don't want to, I don't want to close you. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to our director, Jeanette, to do a word of thanks. Okay, I'm uh, really, uh, this idea of decolonization, I'm really into it. She has said something very important. Uh, uh, I asked the dean of the ambassador when I had a meeting with him. Why can we not create our publisher, African publisher, where she should not have that type of comment? Why do we always need, even when we are saying that we are publishing our paper, why do we only need to publish our paper in the European journal? Can we not create African publisher where African people publish their paper so that European people also publish there and also download those papers so the Africa benefit. How much money you, for example, pay to uh, the university pay to LCD per year? Why that money, a poor country like us, we have to take our small money and give them? Why it cannot be the reverse? Why we cannot do it here? Um, thank you very much, um, colleagues. Uh, over to you, Director. Thank you very much, the program director. I'm going to stand. <laughs> uh, what an awesome day. A round of applause, colleagues. <laughs> um, starting with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Hercules Combrink, who was here earlier but now left, uh, when he unpacked the uh, 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 
the Center for Interdisciplinary Futures. It was just amazing and, and breathtaking. And I'm so glad that uh, whatever that he shared with us, we are going to take as, 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 as the academic community. Because even in the library, we are academics. Yes. <laughs> and then Mr. Albert Van Eck, in, in his absence on the HPC, I think that the library will need a refresher on that. Cornell, we are going to request a, a refresher based on the fact that some of the times there, I felt like a lame, a lame man. And I felt like I need to, to get my, I, I felt that I'm, I must uh, watch that video on my phone with earphones when I'm sleeping at night, just to, you know, to, to, to revive myself. And then thank you again for showcasing our Digital Scholarship Center. Colleagues, that center is yours. When you have visitors, use the center. When you want to collaborate, come and use the center. When you want to have a meeting with your students and in a small way conducting research, come and use our center. It's your space. <laughs> All right. And Prof, thank you so much. You touched my heart. Especially when you spoke about uh, 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 the effect of mining and the landfill that are filling up and, and they are just creating pollution. I once wrote to the president, but who am I? <laughs> I wrote him a letter, I sent him through my Gmail. Mr. President, other countries are using the landfills to create electricity, to generate electricity. Then I got an, uh, what do they call it, electronic response. Nothing ever happened. So you really touched my heart when you spoke about those. And I think maybe this discussion needs to be expanded. The library will provide a space if you need to engage your sp a space and then we'll have, I think we must have forums for our students now from this engagement. Charlie, mm -hmm. we must have a forum for our students where we engage on this uh, issue so that, you know, like our students say that I'm a first year, I'm going to do a PhD after what I had. Thank you very much. Professor Atangana, I, 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 I listened to you on SAFM and they, uh, they were interviewing you and they were saying, but now, why don't you go to, 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 to America because now they are so much into you and you said, who's going to represent Africa? I'm staying here so that Africa is represented on the global platform. And I remember showing my son on, 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 on the, the, this uh, profile that we are doing and I said, that we are doing profiles in the library. And then I said, let me show you and then I show him. And he was like, he stood up, Majino, Majino, that is what we are going for, for open world borders. They must open borders, Majino. <laughs> <laughs> he was already excited to say, look, now we have a gem in, in the country, somebody who's so global, who's acknowledged. And, and really, for us, it's a big thing, Prof, for putting us, never mind those NRF ratings, mm. make that contribution. You will be written in the biggest books of history, and, 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 and you will be a theorist. People will be saying the Atangana theory. And the supervisors will be asking, uh, did you consult the Atangana theory? Because now that's what we are being told nowadays. Uh, 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 what uh, 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 paradigm did you use? Oh. Yes. yes. So yes. thank you so much for, for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, um, uh, uh, reputation that we are building about our university. Our library reveals you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mohatan, you touched the nerve of my heart, especially when you talked about translation and culture. It, it represents who we are. Yes. And, and, and I, I was saying to the other people that, you know, Africans is a good language. It, uh, when it was, it was uh, what do they call it, expanded, what, did, what was happening? Our fathers were building the buildings. They were working on the field. So they didn't get an opportunity to, to also build on our, our language. But now the narrative is changing. Our students are at university. Now they are going to make sure that our languages are also brought up on, 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 on par. Yes, and thank you so much. And I so wish we, when we have that forum, you also bring along your students in Susutu from Kwakwa from here and other students so that we have that forum of of discussion, it's time for us to raise national pride. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof. Elmari, I love gardening. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have green fingers. <laughs> but I'm always working on the, on the soil. And I don't know that people don't realize that working on the soil is so therapeutic. Yes, yes. When you work on the soil, 
you 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 get to get a, a sense of rebuilding. So that is spiritual what you're doing. It's not only for the soil, but it's for for bringing life. You know, the the, the land, the soil is life. Without land, we don't have life. So thank you for doing that amazing work and, and nurture those students so that in future we will harvest great crops and we will be well nourished. So I really appreciate what you have uh, shared with us today. Right. Uh, Dr. Koza, I, I, I can't even start to, to express because I used to be a high school teacher in the past and I used to teach English. You know the struggle, the struggle that these poor learners go through to understand, to read is heartbreaking. So where I'm sitting and you are saying, I'm using my voice as a linguist, as a literary, a literacy development expert. Let us applaud her, colleagues. <laughs> you are building the next generation of leaders in our society and you have to be highly commended for that because everything else comes from uh, literacy so really that's so amazing and we are so grateful as the library and when we have that forum we will also invite the students so they are part of this uh, discussion they get to engage the expert on this <sighs> my son's mentor professor dubey my son loves Professor Dube a lot because now he, he mentors him. And then, and then I was saying to him, what article did you read about Professor Dube? He said, to hell with the bishops. <laughs> <laughs> so if you check on his uh, profile, he has written an article uh, to hell with the bishops. So my son was telling me that he has written, he, he has written the, 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 the article. And, and, and Professor Dube is our mentor in the library. For our action research, he is our mentor, we still need to talk about payments. <laughs> so he is our mentor. I think we have how many papers for Liasa conference? We have, I think six or seven papers. So we'll bring you on board so that you look through our, our papers and our presentations so that when we make our statement there, then they know that the investor of the free state is here. Colleagues is a friend of the library. Professor Duby is always in the library. He's, you know, he's marketing our library. He's part of us. Maybe he needs an office <laughs> in the library. So, and then, um, Mr. Chair, thank you so much for running this uh, event so well. We really appreciate how you, the engagement. And you know, now we, we have other ideas from how you ran this program, Charlie. So we are so very, very uh, grateful. Our technology team, now the world can see us. Yes. Everybody who wants to see us, they are able to see us. And thank you so much for doing this great work and the, for the commitment, the dedication, you know, the always willing to go an extra mile. We really appreciate it. And then our academics, I saw a, 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 a Professor Joel Mukwate Prof. Thank you so much for, 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 for coming. And I haven't seen, the, uh, uh, maybe others I have seen, uh, 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 maybe I might, I might not be aware of their names. And colleagues in the library, this is who we are. We must create space for engagement. And we must, like, and Professor Dube, thank you again for complimenting how student, our, our colleagues are handling. It's in our strategic plan, yes. So thank you so very much for the, work, the amazing work that you are doing to make sure that our academics are on the right platforms. I still feel that we still need to do more to put you out there so that the world can see you. Yeah. I still feel we still need to discuss how best besides yeah. putting you on YouTube yeah. and for the, for the, we must still strategize. Yeah. So that in the next five years, like Professor Reddy was saying, we become one of the top five universities in the country. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you, Director. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we, we, we need to work on something with um, with Prof. Uh, Atangan. Uh, yeah, the, what what happened? Uh, because I, I I followed the the the, the Paris thing. Uh, on the, and then I listened to the speech, and I was not aware he was alone. <laughs> it's it's saddening, 
um, and, and, and again, I agree with him. Praising sports people because we know we would have seen some people at the airport waiting to, to receive somebody who has won the 400 meters. Um, but somebody to win, to, to be recognized at such a high level, it's, it's a disgrace. And as uh, this is a commitment from the library, we are going to, even if we, it means we are going to do it for the whole year, so be it. Uh, until the people hear, uh, because I normally start the war at Facebook. I normally, every time there's an article about him, I, I share it on Facebook and then ask the question about NRF, and then the discussion starts. Um, so, so now I think I must change my, we must change the strategy. Instead of being negative, I'm going to be positive, because I know NRF for him is, no, no. So, so, colleagues, um, Lunch is served. I'm going to uh, ask that we allow our guests uh, to, to, to go and, and um, have dish first, followed by the director, and then the, the, the academics in our midst, and then colleagues from the library, and, uh, and maybe our students, then you can follow later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will be in touch. Okay.